Good morning, distinguished guests and scientists, local ladies and gentlemen. We believe that it's crucial for the local scientific community to share and exchange new ideas and research work with that from abroad. We significantly have Vietnam accelerate international integration. The sixth international conference on nature of computation and communication ICTC 2020 takes place on cyberspace due to the widespread epidemic COVID-19 around the world. Travel was limited. It's organized by European Alliance for Innovation and Western University in organizing the conference. We are also honored to have been well guided and supported by both the co organizer We are happy to see the conference had attracted various prominent scientists from over six countries worldwide. I welcome your innovation idea and research work on nature of computing in attempt to formalize a new computing system in the future. On the behalf of the organizer, we would like to take this opportunity to express our sincere appreciation to all the participants and the co-organizer for their valuable and continued guidance, support and co cooperation, which are indispensable for the success of the events. We wish you have good health, happiness, and every success to your career and development, especially in the future research in the fields to further accelerate the, the development of computer science. Thank you, Thank you very much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to the EAI ICTC 2020, 
6th EI International Conference on Nature of Computation and Communication. I am Alexandra Szczytijowska, the EEI Conference Manager of ICTC 2020. Unfortunately, due to the virus, I am not able to meet all of you in person, so I am using this opportunity to address the organizing committee, the keynote speakers, the authors and the participants on behalf of EAI. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for being a part of this conference and for your involvement with EAI. Above all, I would like to express my gratitude to the General Chair, Professor Fan Kong Win, for his hard and excellent work throughout the whole process of the conference preparation. During today's event, you can actively participate in two ways. Firstly, you can join the Q&A on Slack through a link that you can see below this video. Upon accessing the EAI ICTC 2020 Slack workspace, you can enter the channel called Discussion. Secondly, you can vote on individual presentations and leave your fellow researchers feedback on their work through EAI Compass. We will shortly show you how you can access these platforms and how to leave and receive feedback for presentations in this conference. I would also like to use this message to invite you to join us again soon. Therefore, I am glad to announce that the next edition of the conference will take place in November in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. I invite all of you to participate in ICTC 2021. Should you be interested in being a part of the Technical Program Committee, please do not hesitate to contact me at my email address below. Similarly, if you are interested in discussing other possible cooperation, organizing a conference or a workshop, please contact me at my email address as well. To sum up, it is our honor to organize this year's edition of ICTC Conference. I hope you will have a wonderful time during this event and that you will follow the next edition in 2021. We will keep you posted and the news about this event will be available on the conference website. Now, my colleague Michal will talk more about EI tools and go into more details about the affirmation voting. Thank you for your attention and enjoy EI ICTC 2020. I hope to welcome you again next year in Vietnam. Hi everyone, my name is Michal Dudic. I'm the Committee Manager at EEI, European Alliance for Innovation. It's my pleasure to welcome you at this conference uh, and say a few words about who we are and what we can do for you and your research career. In short, EEI is a global community for a greener, healthier and smarter world. As of today, we are home to more than 60,000 members from 167 countries and we reach out to tens of thousands of subscribers. As an organization, we are nonprofit from day one, and what is most important to us is that we remain open to all researchers from all around the world thanks to membership that is completely free. We organize more than 100 events annually, such as this conference, and we do so in publishing partnership with Springer. I said in the beginning that EAI is a community, so let's talk about what that means and what it means for you. To put it briefly, we give our members a platform that builds their research. We do it with three main online community services where members come together to help each other write a better paper, get an objective review, and get recognized fairly. The three services in question are EAI Compass, Community Review, and EAI Index. Firstly, EAI Compass is an online app where you can meet and connect with new colleagues and get feedback on your paper as well as your presentation. In addition to that, it lets you download all full papers that will be presented at this conference and you can vote on your favorite presentations as well as see everyone who is here and connect with them. You can do this right now if you go to EAI Compass website, compass.eai.eu. Next, we are improving the classic conference review process with community review. It has already been in use at all our events since 2019 and we were very excited to hear a lot of positive feedback from program committee members regarding the reliability and the speed of the community review. Let's talk briefly about what community review does. Essentially, it is a website that shows abstracts of papers that are right in the middle of the review process, as long as the authors allow it, of course and all EAI members may then bid to review specific papers. 
When they submit their bid, they put in their bio and their qualifications, which are sent to the program committee, who can then decide whether or not this bidder is qualified to review the paper they bid on. This relatively easy access to review opportunities means that bidders really need to put their best foot forward if they wish to be selected, which improves the quality of the entire review process. At the end of the day, this benefits you, the author. And last but not least, let me tell you a thing or two about EAI Index. EAI Index is our credit-based evaluation system that we rolled out this year to all of our conferences and journals that allow you to climb the global ranks of EAI community and get recognized for your work. It calculates a number of value for most actions you make, such as getting your paper accepted or submitting a review, and these numbers accumulate for 12 months. At the end of this 12-month period, we put together a ladder of all EEI members and the ones at the top receive a nomination to one of the membership ranks – senior member, distinguished member or fellow. For each action that is eligible for EEI index credits, we'll look at the quality of your action as it was evaluated by another member of the community, such as, for example, the review score of your submission. To make sure that the system is fair to newcomers, every 12 months the credit count gets erased, the ones at the top receive their nominations, and every member starts at zero for the following 12 months. And finally, Smart Submit is a collaboration feature that is coming later this year. It will allow you to submit your research ideas and your work in progress abstracts to get the kind of help and feedback you're looking for. Maybe you are looking for co-authors, maybe you would like to find a mentor or a mentee, or maybe you want to find out how the community feels about your idea. This is what Smart Submit is designed for. Ultimately, it's about helping you write a better paper and increasing your chances of getting accepted. Again, we will be launching this feature later this year, so stay tuned. And so I'm going to leave you with many different ways to get engaged at different levels. There are lots of opportunities in many of our events and publications, which means many ways to connect with people and collaborate. You may learn more about everything I just talked about at our website, eai.eu. These services exist to help you and to make your lives easier, so we encourage you to send us your comments, ideas, and feedback to community at eai.eu. And if you're interested in volunteering and contributing, you can let us know at the same email address. Don't forget that you can use EAI Compass to vote on presentations in real time to determine which ones are the best, as well as to download all full papers that will be presented today. Just make sure that you log in using the same email address as the one you used to register to this conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please enjoy the conference and I hope we will see everyone online soon.
Dear colleagues and friends, thank you very much for the invitation to give also in 2020 the keynote for our two conferences. Unfortunately, I have to record it before the conference. I cannot stand in front of you and give you that speech by myself, but I hope you will enjoy the talk, however. The title of that talk is Brain Inspired Methods for Natural Language Programming, and it's derived a little bit from our experience doing natural language processing for over 10 years now. And very often we found that what we are doing on our computers works in a similar manner like our brain, and that gives the inspiration for the talk today. We will have four main chapters in that talk. After a short introduction, I will introduce you to some interesting facts about the brain. We will then derive our text representing centroids, speak about abstraction, oblivion and sequence learning, and finally see how we can apply those experiences in the context of the World Wide Web. Understanding our brain is in fact a very important task for two major reasons. The first is, of course, that the brain is until now still the most powerful known communication and information processing unit in the world. And if you look on a lot of parameters, like its performance, its need for energy, then it is much better than any computer we have built so far. The second reason is comes from our profession. Uh, we shall learn from the nature how information processing can work in an efficient manner. Because, of course, in the nature only mechanisms survive which are well prepared uh, to be better than other individuals. So in the long process of evolution, the human brain has been developed to such a powerful and effective unit that we today have to learn from it a lot. Uh, when I looked for a good start of the talk, I found out that there are a lot of information coming into my attention about the topic. So I realized what everybody of you knows in its daily work process, there's an information overflow to all of us. There are much more information available today than we can uh, process. And so, of course, our brain needs powerful methods to handle that mess of information which are coming to us. So, how we can do so? We see a lot of information, we see a lot of books, a lot of files, for instance, in the World Wide Web. We don't have the time to read uh, everything, and many information are there in a doubled manner, in a similar manner. So, we must anyhow find a way to make the process of gathering information more systematic than it has been so far. And one possibility for so is, of course, the possibility to make a categorization of information, to divide useful and unuseful information in the one subject or information in another subject in a suitable manner for us. And that we can do if we find some abstraction, some names for categories, some names for classes, which are summarizing a whole set of other documents. So, first point, what we can learn from our brain is we are able to summarize things, we are able to abstract from unnecessary properties of a thing and build hierarchies. The second thing is our brain do not keep every information it may obtain from the environment. For instance, if you are looking in a class, you are focused on the one or the other student. If you are drive a car, you focus uh, on the things happen on the street in front of you. That comes from a very nice structure of our brain. Uh, the brain has three different kind of memories, as we can see in this picture here. The input information comes first to a sensory memory, where unintended information is lost immediately. Only a few information get it to come into our short-term memory. That means are kept uh, a little bit longer 
then the time the information is needed just to react on it like uh, during driving. So in our short-term memory, of course, information we only need for a short period are lost after some times. But there are also some information which we need again and again and again. And for such information, the border to the long-term memory can be crossed. We keep that information forever in our brain. And only when we get old, when a long time uh, is gone and we didn't use that information, we forget it. So that is what we really sometimes recognize in our brain as an oblivion process. Uh, but it is very important for us that we can forget things also we don't want to know uh, for all our life. And last but not least, all the humans live in a society consisting of many, many individuals and Every day new humans are born, some humans are dying, and of course the death is also a form of an oblivion process in a society which allows the society to renew itself, to go on in its development. We see that, for instance, if we are looking on the learning curve of our brain, especially we as teachers in a university or in a school know that process every day. If we are teaching our students some information, some new knowledge, then the oblivion process starts already. Normally, if you come back the same the next day to the same class, only 80% of the information is still available. Many pupils have forgot the information. So you must repeat the information. And the more often you repeat the respective information, uh, the longer the information is kept in the student's brain. And hopefully you can reach a point where that information is never lost again. Last but not least, there's an observation you may make when you are working often with students. Then you may recognize that uh, the information is not just learned fact by fact. So that means not a pile of words define a particular content, but the sequence of things make it interesting. So for instance, also if you have to handle a task in your daily environment, you do not keep one fact after another, but you keep the whole sequence. And what you are learning is which activity you have to do one after the other. So here's an example uh, where you can see that everybody of know you know the alphabet. You can say the ABC very easy in the manner as you learned it from the first to the last letter. But if I give you the task to say it the other way around, so starting by Z and going backwards to A, you can try it right now, then that is a really difficult task for you, and you have to use your brain to fulfill that task in the right manner. So the same happens, for instance, uh, when I ask you to sing or to recognize a melody backwards. So the important information is for you, we learn not facts, we don't keep facts in our brain, but our brain is keeping sequences of information. <clears throat> And that the sequence is also important, you can see in the second example on that slide. Uh, you see there the same sentence, the beautiful lady always wears ugly dresses. And in the second sentence, just ugly and beautiful are exchanged. And you see, by changing the sequence of the word, we get a completely different contents. So that must be kept anyhow in our brain, that if anything, what we have to keep in mind when we want to process natural language. So that means the sequence uh, of word is a very interesting thing which can change contents, which can help us to understand things in the right manner. <coughs> Another scientist's work has influenced 
uh, our research a lot. Uh, I already cited in my last year's talk, it's Jeff Hawkins, uh, who wrote a book with the name uh, On Intelligence and give us for the first time as computer scientists a microscopic view into the brain. So the brain has many different parts. I will give you an overview through my next slides. And he confirmed what I told you in the last slide already. He confirmed that information are stored in pattern sequences. So these pattern sequences are put in our brain, not as we know, into a memory, cell one, information one, cell two, information two, but the pattern are kept in an auto in an auto associative manner and what is very important they are kept in an invariant form so just to give you an example what invariant form mean you recognize a dog as a dog no matter to which race it belong you recognize a dog no matter from which side you see it or how far the dog is away from you and of course, as we have seen in former slides already, we are able to build abstractions, we are able to build hierarchies, so we don't wonder much that our brain works, of course, also in a hierarchic manner. To give you also an example for that, another example are the decades of your eyes when you are recognize a person in front of you. You don't recognize the whole picture, the whole face, also it may seem to you so. But your eyes are doing in an un unconscious manner a series of jumps over the face, fixing the eyebrows, fixing the distance between the eyebrows, going down to the north. And from that pathway of over a face, the face is recognized as a sequence of information which are automatically generated by your eyes. So let's look a little bit more detailed into the neurocortex, the area of our brain which uh, really is responsible for keeping the respective information. So the first what you can see is that our brain is divided into different areas which are responsible for different tasks because they are of course also connected with the different sensors we have, <coughs> with the different uh, actors we have by our muscles. So we can identify the area for speech, we can identify an area for smell, for visual recognition, and of course also for reading and speaking. If we would cut our cortex, we would recognize that there are six layers of the cortex, as we have seen in the right picture, connected to the different sensors, to our touching sensors in the fingers, to the ears, to the eyes. And those six layers of the neurocortex are organized in a hierarchical manner, keeping in the upper layers spatially invariant, slow changes, objects, for which we have then an abstract name. The important thing is that we not only can recognize information by the sensors, process them in the way going up from the lower cortex levels to the other upper cortex levels, but we also may imagine as a house and the information is going down and when we can specify the activities we need to know to build up a house or to recognize a house of a given architectural style. So there's both. There's a flow of information up in the levels of our cortex and also an information flow from the upper levels down to uh, our actors. What we want to do now is we want to consider the brain even more detailed. That means we want to consider one layer of 
the six layers of the neurocortex. And if we are doing so, we will recognize that again every layer of the cortex is divided into six sublayers, L1 to L6. And the lower layer, the layer L6, is a layer where neurons will be activated in case we obtain any inputs from our sensors. For instance, in case our eye recognize a set of different triangles. So in that manner, the information comes to layer L6, and the layers L6 to L2 are something like a classical neural network where the information is going up now. We can imagine that in our cortex there are so-called columns, that means vertical directed neural networks are working, which are responsible to uh, recognize each of them a given context. So for instance, the column we see here now is an activated column, which is activated from any kind of triangles. Of course, there might be some columns around, some neural networks around, which are also activated because of there might be similar figures to triangles like a star or anything else. For that purpose, we have uh, inhibitors in the levels L2 and L3, which are connected to columns with similar activation contents in the neighborhood. And those inhibitors uh, reduce the activation of the columns and ensure that we get a unique invariant prediction from one column uh, in our neurocortex. So while these columns are now something like vertical structures, the layer one built up a horizontal structure where we have neurons connecting the different columns with each other for the later process of the sequence prediction. And those informations are also forwarded to a unit in our brain, which is called the thalamus, which is from the point of view of the neuroscientist, the unit which is responsible for naming and for abstraction. So once we get the column with our triangles activated, the information of the activation of that column is given to the thalamus. The thalamus has now different possibilities. It can say the recognized triangles are the first activation part of a series, which can be continued with the one or the other information. So depending on the sequences kept in the thalamus, now another set of information columns is pre-activated. That means the brain expects that we get an input for those columns and the concrete input which will arrive now will decide whether the one or the other sequence is used for the continuation. If no respective information is arrived, it means there is a sequence we don't know. Then we have to switch to the learning modus and have to learn some new sequences which we don't know yet. That was the first part of the learning process of the brain and of the inf information prediction process of our brain. That is the reason why we often say that the brain is not a memory, but a sequence prediction machine. And the second process, which is very interesting for us in the brain, is a process of the modular segregation that we can observe when young children start learning the language, then we are seeing that the brain is keeping the very first the words. The connection between the words are built like connection between those columns in the last picture when the words appear often together. So a child might be able to learn that the word father and mother belong together, 
that the words house and window and roof belong together. And as you can see, the more words we learn, the more we learn how those words appear together, the more strongly connected clusters about one topic will appear, which can be differentiated from clusters about other topics with other words and other connections. So that is what we uh, call neurodevelopment, and that is something what has a direct connection to our natural language processing. But before I can speak about that, I have to introduce you to another development, which was very important for us for the natural language processing, the so-called text representing centroid. So the text representing centroids directly based on co-occurrences and on co-occurrence graphs. And you will see those co-occurrence graphs have a direct relation to the graph I showed you from the modular segregation in the brain. A co-occurrence in a natural language processing is just the joint appearance of two words in a sentence. So how often those co-occurrences appear is described by their frequency f. Of course, sometimes words only very seldom randomly appear together. Sometimes they are appearing very frequent together. And if we are considering a threshold sigma and considering only co-occurrences with a frequency higher than that given threshold, then we can get the significant occurrences which are very important for determining the contents of a text or doing further considerations. So here's a little example for you. Four sentences you can read by yourself containing, if we considering the nouns only, the four nouns men, woman, year and baby. And you can build up a co-occurrence graph by having the words as the nodes of the co-occurrence graph an edge connecting two words if the co-occurrence appear, and the number denotes the frequency, how often that co-occurrence appears. So you see immediately, man and woman is a very often co-occurrence. It's appear with a frequency of three. So sometimes we don't consider the frequency of words. Sometimes we are speaking about the words belonging to each other, they are close to each other, describe similar contents. So then it makes sense to def define a distance between words, and the distance is just the reciproc of the respective frequency. So you see the distance between men and women is one third only, they are much closer than, for instance, men and baby with a frequency and a distance of one. If we are applying finally the threshold of two, a lot of edges disappear, a lot of nodes get isolated nodes and maybe also deleted, and our co-occurrence graph get a little bit smaller, uh, and we may see the important relations from our little story or corpus. So these facts we can now use to define the text representing centroids. We were looking for something similar like the center of mass in the physics. That means a point which I can use to represent the whole body, make all calculations with that and get information what the whole body is doing. So like the point uh, of that bird which you have to support, and when you support that point, you have exactly the center of the mass in the convex hull. And you can calculate everything only with that point. And the bird is in a perfect balance when you support that point. So the question is how you can transfer that model for our natural language processing into our co-occurrence graph. You can do it a little bit easier if you use the model of having several mass points and can calculate the center of that discrete mass points. Why it's so? It's so because 
of our core currents graph with the node and edges look much more uh, like a body of discrete mass points than such a continuous body like our bird is. So we are going to our core currents graph after the introduction of the significance. We remove all isolated nodes, we get a smaller core currents graph. And it seems to be clear that the nodes of that core, core currents graph, the words of our text, correspond to the mass point, while the distance is given either by the distance of the edge or the distance from the word read to classroom is given by the sum of the distances along the shortest path between classroom and weight. So and now a centroid of a document is simply the term with the minimum average distance to all words in the respective documents of the core currents graph, similar to the physics. Just to demonstrate it to you, if we have a document containing classroom, teacher, students, and a little bit more far away computer in its structure, then you see already the word school is something what is in the middle, what have a short distance to all the words and rep would represent the text very well. That means would give us an impression what the text is about. It's anything about school. And if we are looking on the expressivity of our text representing centroids within a lot of the Wikipedia articles, then we see something very nice besides the 100% automatic calculable nature of our text representing centroids. We see that very often generalizing terms are found. For instance, in Blade, the film Blade Runner, Ridley Scott is a major actor. Milk is definitely a subclass of dairy. Malaria is a disease. So you see often generalizing terms will be found. Often uh, terms uh, will be found which the, describe the documents very nice. Also, we can also find terms which are even not a part of our document. So for instance, many Rembrandts hang in the Louvre. So when you discuss about Rembrandt, you get Louvre as a centroid term. Uh, and you see directly the connection because the Louvre is a, is a host of many of such pictures. So it's anyhow a center term to which is connected today uh, with Rembrandt. So an important thing for us later will be that you can calculate centroids uh, not depending on the length of the text. That means a centroid term can be assigned to a long text in the same manner as to a search, uh, as to a short search query, which just connect of a set of few words. So now we can go on. Now we can speaking about much more advanced things like modular segregation and clustering in our core occurrence graph, because of the core occurrence graph is now for us something like the contents of our brain the condensed, compressed information of a text we have read so far. And what you are seeing immediately is, of course, the processes of, of our brain, when we read a book, can be compared with the processes we can do in our computer to build up the core current graph. While we are reading a document or a book, new words are learned, or the core occurrence graph is extended beside its use. Relations between the new learned words uh, are added, of course. And of course, we know already that the core occurrence graph is something like a small world graph. That means cluster will emerge in that network. And of course, those clusters are something like a categorization of words we have read. Yeah, and of course, a document classified by a given centroid, which belong to a given cluster, realizes something like a categorization of the document, making it belonging to a cluster of terms 
we have identified in the core currents graph. That gives us a fully new idea of a clustering when we consider how the brain is doing the clustering. So when we hear about a cluster, of course, we think about a set of nodes and we think about a distinguished node, which is a cluster center. So normally, a node belong to a cluster when it's closer to the respective cluster center than to any other cluster center of other nodes which exist already. We use that idea in another manner. We say a node belong to a cluster center when it's not too far away from the respective cluster center. And as we know from physics from measurement theory, when we establish a raw of measurements, then there is a mean value and values belong to that measurement raw in case they are not too far away from the mean value. In most cases, not, no more, not more away from the mean value than the mean value plus or minus two times the standard deviation. So in our cluster, if we are considering the cluster center, every node have a distance to the respective cluster center given by the edges or by the shortest path to the cluster center. We can calculate the average distance of every node from the cluster center. We can calculate a mean value and a standard deviation and Every node belong to the cluster center when it is no more away than the mean average distance plus two times the standard deviation. So that means nodes which are far away will be removed from the cluster. That may change the cluster center, of course. Nodes which are very close to the cluster center may be added may also change the position of the cluster center. So And so you see, when we add new nodes to the core currents graph, when we change the weight of the respective edges in the core currents graph, we may have to update our clusters by adding nodes, by removing nodes, by updating the cluster center and repeating that process again and again. That means memberships are successively adapted when new documents are read immediately in that moment, not with the learning phase as the neural networks, and we get a new understanding of the clustering. The advantage is the described mechanism is working in a solely local manner. That means we don't have to look on other clusters, other cluster centers, other data. We just have to look on the environment which we have. And that is something very nice, especially in the area of distributed computing. What else can we do? I come to section three of my talk. We can speak about abstraction, oblivion, and sequence learning. So hierarchies are built. If we are consider our co-occurrence graph we have built so far, if we obtain the clusters in the core currents graph and represent the clusters by their centroids. And if we take those centroid terms as representatives of the cluster, we get a next level graph by taking those centroids, taking in the next level the interconnections, that means the edges between the clusters represented by the cluster centroids, and we can play that game until only one node is left. So that defines a new building of hierarchies, a new hierarchical clustering or an abstraction process. What else is important? Oblivion is important. That was the start of our talk. So let's make a little example from the natural language processing. In 1970, we may have a part of a co-occurrence graph having separated words like coal, which is the North German name for cabbage, chancellor, and Schröder, which is the name of a German's 
and like Kohl and Schröder have been to chancellors, uh, yeah, there must be any connections. And those connections come 1982 when Kohl became a German chancellor. We got an edge. And when Kohl reunited Germany, his name was in every mouth. So the connection between Chancellor Kohl gets stronger until in 1998 a new chancellor was elected, Mr. Schröder. Now that connection appears slightly get sicker while people forgot about Chancellor Cole more and more. Uh, and if the time is going on, of course, other names, other chancellors of Germany becoming important, changing the game again. So I told you the human brain like to focus, humans like to learn and forget. And of course, we can do that modeling process by weight adaptions in the co-occurrence graph in the same manner. We may apply an exponential oblivion process to the edges of the co-occurrence graph and only keep a few basic permanent information without oblivion, while other information's weight and distance is changing in every time step and might even get lost. So last but not least in the sections is the topic of sequence learning. Also in relation to our co-occurrence graph, of course. So the question is, can we learn, like our brain, frequent sequences of, it, uh, of terms? For instance, to write <laughs> abstract or to derive uh, the, the following sentences for, for an answering machine. So what we are doing is the following. We consider, for instance, a term A in a co-occurrence graph, which is followed by the words B, C, and D. There's another sequence. We learn A, K, L, M from uh, the starting word A. And you see already the longer I do it, the more a tree-like structure may exist. So, and the weights along the tree denotes the frequency, how often the respective sequence of word has appeared. So the problem is the tree structure may not keep any sequence we may have seen. So you see now ABXY is the next appearing sequence. After B, all possible subtrees are taken already. And I get another form of an oblivion because now I have to replace the one subtree. That means I have to delete an old, long not used sequence and replace it by X and Y. So, two things I got by that. I learned frequently used sequences and I forgot again something. I forgot those sequences I don't use very often in my daily life. So, and last but not least, of course, the end of the one sequence, maybe the start of the next sequence. So, if anything finished by Y, then the continuation goes on with the next note. Uh, so, the possible start of the next sequence is coming after the last word of the before sequence. So that is something what I can easily implement uh, on top of my co-occurrence graph. The degree times the depth of the tree can be interpreted something as an intelligence. I'm more intelligent if I can recognize long sequences. I'm more intelligent if I can remember different alternatives of a sequence. And of course, the more often I use a sequence and the higher the weight is, the longer I shall keep it uh, in case of I have to replace the one of the other uh, sequence. So the last thing about what I have to speak about is how we do the routing in a big map of information in a big 
co-occurrence graph when I recognize as an individual only a little part uh, of that information I have uh, in the whole co-occurrence graph. So for instance, if I have a global map of information like passes from the one location in Europe to another location, there are probably much more streets and much more connection than I may have in my mind when I'm focusing to a given topic. So in case that global graph is represented in my local knowledge only partially, but if it's a really partial knowledge, then away from France to the Czech Republic, which I have in my local brain, will be also to be found in my global graph. So that means if I can build a global co-occurrence graph from many, many different users reading different documents with different wordings, different experiences, every of the respective users may use his local knowledge to navigate in the global graph too. And that is a very important thing what we need to know in case we want to do natural language processing in a distributed uh, computing environment, namely on a peer-to-peer -peer system, then you know a single user has only his local knowledge. The global knowledge, the global co-occurrence graph of the whole community may be distributed over several peers. That might be very important because in such a manner we can use the distributed computing performance of all peers. And only locally you have to recognize when a peer border is crossed in order to find, however, the local way from France to the Czech Republic, also over several peers in the big global co-occurrence graph. I told you a lot of ideas now about what we are doing in the context of natural language processing in the co-occurrence graph with methods inspired by our brain. However, we apply it for the navigation for the search in the World Wide Web which we consider as a human brain. So what we did, I told you last year already, we added a little component to the recently existing web servers, hosting web pages which are connected by links. We add a peer-to-peer -peer level to it. We connect the peers which are now a part of every web server by links following the link structure of the respective web pages. And we get a new World Wide Web system where every web server might also contribute to the navigation in that system, just in case if we find respective mechanisms for doing so. And of course, also other computers may be a part of that systems, even if not hosting web pages, but just accessing web pages as clients with the respective web browsers. <coughs> so, what we have built with that knowledge I have introduced to you is something like a completely new, fully decentralized and integrated web search engine. The web engine version 2, which has a peer structure and I want to bring you the functionality to it. So what we are calling the brain is nothing else than a global built co-occurrence graph, which is distributed over several peers in the World Wide Web system, which are the part of all the web servers. And every of that peer hosts a part of the big, big co-occurrence graph and the nodes of the core occurrence graph, the word behind, are the text representing centroids 
which determine which documents are attached to them. That means if a web page has a given text representing centroid, its URL is assigned to the node in the co-occurrence graph, which have the same name, represents the same word as the text representing centroid of that document. That distribution is possible because the peer-to-peer -peer system gives us an interface such that many of that peers can cooperate in managing that huge co-occurrence graph with its, with its attached information. So every user has from its daily life, from reading some documents he obtained from the web he wrote on his PC, obtained a local co-occurrence graph, which of course is used to extend and build up the big co-occurrence graph, but of course every human knows only a few partial words. He is daily using something like 800 to 2000 words. Specialists have special words in their given area of interest, but as we have seen in the last section, those local graphs can be used for navigation. The interest of the users can be also used not only to read files he found by himself, we may establish a crawler. The crawler works in the night when the network has not much load. It brings us documents depending on the interest areas we have configured. So we get every morning 10 files, for instance, which we are interested in. But those files are also used to update the user's local co-occurrence graph and of course in the same manner the global co-occurrence graph by mechanisms we have worked out. If a user is looking for any new information, he formulated by a query. From the query, the text representing centroid is built using the user's local co-occurrence graph. Depending on its state of knowledge, it will be a text representing centroid, of course, which is a part of his local co-occurrence graph, which is built from his experience. May differ if another user do the same. Then you go to the global co-occurrence graph, find by our routing algorithm the respective node corresponding to the text representing centroid of the query and you can give back the user the answer by the documents assigned to that node. And that works quite well. I brought you here the web engine's interface with you. You see, as I showed you in the before here, if you look for transport water and temple, you get a query quality depending on how far your search queries are away from each other in the core occurrence graph. You see, a part of the co-occurrence graph uh, showing you the TRC of your query, show you your query terms, may give you some additional ideas how you can improve your search query or some it may give you some hints for what other text representing centroids you might directly use because they are in the neighborhood. Yeah, and finally, you get in a similar manner like in Google, the respective research, search results back. If you don't apply this mechanism in a distributed manner all over the web, but if you apply it on a single computer, a single computer might be able to read words and might be able to find the relation between the words. And of course, for many recommender systems, it's also valid that uh, things which belong to each other are also on a single co-occurrence graph on a local machine close to each other by the distance. So, and in such a manner, we came to the idea, yes, of course, if we describe a disease by symptoms, the most probable disease must be the disease which is close to its symptoms. 
So you see now here, for instance, if you describe a disease by having itch, having headache, having fever, it might be very probable that you have dengue fever. Dengue fever may have other uh, symptoms like developing a rash, maybe cord is also related in that area, not from dengue fever, but from another information. So you can give the doctor information what additional symptoms he may ask the patient about. So that mean I am able to build up something like a dialogue system where a doctor, which may have not much experience because he is young, can enter some symptoms, get information about possible diseases, get information about other symptoms, he may speak with the patient over it. And if we learn more and more specialized uh, description about diseases from the literature, from uh, patient documentaries, from scientific publication, such a system may be a help, especially for young doctors to meet the right diagnosis. Because especially in an experience science like medicine, we find it very often that we have much more literature available than a human can read. And our system can be a help for that in an interactive process. And we make experiments with 250 most spread diseases in Thailand. We take symptoms and diseases as special words following the CDC list and we get extremely good results already with that little system. And we will go on working on that, of course, in the future. So, the story is at the end. I roughly give you an overview of what we are doing with our research. Uh, there's also much, much more to speak about than I can tell you within that short time of my keynote today. We may have available some copies of our book theory and application of text representing centroids. I wrote together with my friend and colleague Mario Kubek. If you are interested in that, let me know and I will be happy to send you a copy. I would be also very happy if you would give us some reflections on our research on what we have done here. Meanwhile, a bigger project starting from our investigation of text representing centroids and evolving centroids. You saw in my talk, we add many knowledge about learning, about segregation, about clustering, about hierarchies and abstractions, about frequent sequence, sequence learnings and oblivions. I showed you in my last slides, we are going to the application of those new mechanisms within a project together with the King Mongkut University of Technology, North Bangkok. And of course, we are, would be happy to answer your question. We would be happy to work with you. We would be happy to have you as our collaborators in that new project. So thank you very much for your attention to listen to me. Thank you very much for joining us in that virtual conference. Uh, on my very last slide, you see my contact data and we all would be happy to hear from you. Thank you very much and bye bye.
Hello everyone. Welcome here on to my talk. I am Tom, a PhD student working at the Distributed System Group, University of Gasa, Germany. The topic of my talk today is a third worst service corruption in SOA environments, a survey. The goal is to provide a technical document to researchers who are building application related to service coevolution. And this work is funded by the project named Prosecco. In the following slide about the outline, first I would provide the motivation of this survey. Next is our approach. And then the proposed results during this survey. And finally, I summarize the presentation today. Let's begin with some basic concepts tour in service-oriented architecture. The first one is the service. The service is a fundamental building blocks of SOA. And the service may play three approaches, such as service providers, service consumer or service broker and service are subject to constant change and variation. It have different owners with different business agendas and they are free to evolve in independent fashion. So I have just made clear about this term in the service oriented architecture environments. And the next one is the service evolution it is a continuous process of service development through a series of consistent and unambiguous chains. And service evolution is expressed through a service difference version. It evolves typically due to change in structures, for instance, attributes and operation, or in behaviors or policy such as adding new business rules and regulation. And obviously, service evolution may bring many benefits for a whole ecosystem. However, some existing clients may encounter difficulties in working and interacting with the modified service provider. Another important term in this survey is the service coevolution. Actually, it is a special case of service evolution. It contains the meaning of the coordination and cooperation of service for co-evolving activities of chains. And as you can see from the figure, here we have a many type of service have a connection. Here we assume the node S0 we actively connected to S1 and other nodes and similarly similarly S2 sorry S1 is connected to the node S2 and S3 and the nodes further connected to other nodes considering a scenario in which S2 involves to a new version, but at three is not affected at all. In this case, the chain is confined to the client of at two only. However, in the case of evolution of at two, implies us the nodes at zero, s one, and at three should also involve a coordination fashion. We call this at a coevolution service, where the evolution required to update. The independent services. Let's go in deep in the motivation where we need to answer some general questions. Why do we need a service evolution as well co evolution? And what are available technical approaches focused on service co evolution? 
And what about the available source square support service coevolution? And what is the role of an imaging chain named microservice and its advantage as well as challenge related to service coevolution? And these are the questions we need to answer during the survey. We will approach by combining the different search terms such as service chains or evolutionary chains or service evolution and of course important term name service coevolution. We also use other terms service incompatible, service compatible and service versioning and so on. And we mainly focus on 20 frequently cited approach and groups authors and here is the seven database well-known database we are using for our survey one of the first result is the a proposed chain taxonomy this the taxonomy is the based on the previous works here we make clearly and adapt it slightly from the the previous research work. We divide service chain can be categorized into functional chains or non-functional chains. Functional chains can divide deeper into semantic chains, business process interface or behavior. On the other hand, on non-functional chains, it can divide into policy or QoS chains. And as you can see clearly in the figure one, it's a hierarchy tree, so you can see. And it gives it very detailed, the connection relationship between these chains. Together, we provide a Terminology that make clear the definition of the type chains. For instance, in behavior, it should belong to functional and policy does belong to non-functional. And other results in this survey is the evolution process. We ca categorize it into three phases. The chain detection is the first phase. Next is the service impact analyst. And finally is the reaction. And it all of this process make a circle for service development. And uh, the first one, I want to mention a little bit more in the chain detection. And that is the critical process in service evolution management. It helps affect the service to find out chains as well as kind of chain that can be used as the input data for analyzing the impact level. And so far, researcher classifies evolutionary chain in different type critical chains. And chain impact analysts with the goals is the tool understanding the relationship between the service and the chain and the service user have a subsequent effect therefore it need to know which part of system will be affected by the chain and then examine them for additional impacts and the last one is the chain reaction this process may involve other further steps such as decision making propagation of chain or an optional broader chain and whenever some new feature are added or modify the service the developer must ensure that other system entities are updated and consistent in response and this is the overview of evolution process next one is the support service evolution. 
Here we distinguish four kinds of approaches. And first one is based on the tune model, and then is a based on the versioning approach, and the third is the pattern adapter based, and fourth is the analyst of chain impacts based. And please note that some approach may belong to more than one category. And uh, table two below describes the key contribution, the name of authors, available source code status, and various kind of evolution process. And as you can see from the table two, for instance, the first group authors is the Papojolo and Andri Kupolo. And the, the key contribution is to classify and analyze the salvage and deep chains. They also provide a set of theories and models that are unify different aspects of service. And they, their work focuses on kind of chains. And the process they focus on is chain detection, chain impact analyst, and chain reaction. And in this table, we present shortly the key contribution as well the main point they focus on and the next one very important one is the support service coevolution we highlight some contribution so far beyond the research works the first one is the classification of evolutionary chains. The second one is the process of coevolution using meta models in motor driven engineering. Other one is the requirements for service coevolution. That is the discovery in 2015 by a Trento University group. Other one is the by a Chinese group. The name distributed knowledge by evolution model. And finally, also recently, a recent service coevolution management model uh, together with multi agent architecture support for our service coevolution. Uh, this works are uh, public in the Prosecco. And let's see the outlook. The term microservice refers to a new software production model including continuous deployment, continuous deliveries, and continuous evolving and managing. A microservice basically is a, a form of service-oriented architecture and it has one big the, the, the biggest advantage is the loose coupling and drawback of the microservice environment is the speedy producing a map service versions may need more effort to handle various versions in a short period of time. Today's microservice architecture has been adopted in different forms by many companies such as Netflix, Google, Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon. Uh, these companies have recognized us by using microservice architecture. The software products deliver circle will be shorter. And because there is no barriers in timing to releasing new service version, and thus their customer may update new version instantly and transparently. And this uh, overview of outlook of the microservice environment in Recently, and finally, in the talk today, I have just presented a survey on frequently cited approaches, support service coevolution in SOA. We propose a new taxonomy of chains. We distinguish three main processes of service evolution, and finally, we give an outlook to an emergent trends named microservice and analyze its effects as well as drawbacks regarding to a service coevolution. And the next is the references we are using for this uh, presentation today.
again thank you very much for the pay attention and I wish you all of you have a safety in the pandemics of Corona
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tomáš Svoboda. I'm from Faculty of Informatics and Management, University of Hradec Králové in Czech Republic. And I would like to introduce to you a presentation about our paper titled Analysis of HIPS Solution Use in Power Systems. This presentation consists of four parts. In the first part, I would like to introduce to you some information about power systems and in the next part we will talk about HIPS solution security systems. In the third part I will talk about uh, our proposed methodology with emphasis to technical solutions, measurement and also the obtained results and conclusion will be the final of this presentation so the nowadays the modern society cannot function without the existence of communication connection via computer networks and access to the internet the use of this type of communication can be observed throughout the society. Uh, it can be found in systems falling under a critical infrastructure of individual countries, in ordinary work activities or in private home Wi-Fi networks. Significant progress in the field of improving security of power systems was made until uh, 2010 when uh, Stuxnet was discovered. Stuxnet are, uh, was focused on SCADA, uh, i.e. energy control systems, and it was a sophisticated uh, kind of virus. Nowadays, there are a large number of security solutions which are applicable or uh, it can be implemented in uh, power systems. However, these solutions uh, can only cover a certain part of security of these systems. Nowadays, the typical defense against cyber attacks targeting power systems is realized by protecting the communication infrastructure with the use of firewalls, proxy servers, application uh, solutions, etc. And also uh, critical components of control systems. Uh, for example, SCADA server, communication server, etc. However, the use of such security mechanism or solutions does not solve the main security problems of power systems. Firstly, uh, it's the integration of equipment to which standard security policies can be applied. And secondly, the existence of internal incidents related to security breach of power systems. Uh, one of the solutions to these problems is to use the host intrusion prevention systems, which can monitor the activity on a particular device or uh, on the end device. Uh, this kind of solutions, as well as HIPS technology, uh, has uh, defined rules within which it restricts unsolicited access to specific data and also the monitoring with these solutions is performed by analyzing network events on the device. So, based on these solutions and for these reasons, as I said, we decided to realize comparative analysis of HIPS solutions. 
To ensure that operations are performed in the shortest time possible, it's essential to implement a HIP solution with minimal requirements for system resources. Because if the implementation of a HIP solution, which would lead to consumption of a large amount of system resources, would result in extension of time intervals needed for necessary operations within power systems. So, uh, in the methodology, we focused on three open source HIPS solutions. They are ReHIPS, Komodo Internet Security, and Deep Security. We use the personal computer as a single tool for analyzing the use of system resources by the tested HIPS solutions. And this personal computer has a specific uh, conf hardware configuration which is uh, flowing. Uh, it has a Windows 10, uh, Intel Core 2 Duo, 2 GB of RAM, NVIDIA GeForce uh, GPU, and 500 GB of uh, hard drive. Also, the personal computer had a network adapter, and we realized the uh, obtain to data uh, by using a tool which called the System Explorer. And there are our obtained results. In initial state, the average usage of the device, the time period, which was 10 minutes. In the initial state, the average processor CPU usage during this uh, defined time period was only 10%. The average usage of RAM during the defined time period was 58% and average usage of web partition was 31%. Next, we use a rehips solution and we obtained uh, these results. Average usage with the rehips solution uh, average processor usage during the defined time period was 60%. Average usage of RAM during the defined time period was 72%, and average usage of swap partition was 35%. In the second case, when we use a Commodo Internet Security HIPS solution, the average processor usage during the defined time period was 50%. And the reason for such usage was fast launch of a device scan. The average usage of RAM during the defined time period was 77%. This results means the 90% increase of random access memory usage in comparison with the initial state. Average usage of swap partition was 35%. And in the third case, so when we use the deep security HIPS solution, the average processor usage during the defined time period was 75%. This results means that there was a 65% increase of CPU usage in comparison with the initial state. The average usage of RAM during defined time period was 81%, and average usage of swap partition was 44%. Based on obtained results, we uh, propose the comparative analysis of open source HIPS solutions with an emphasis on the use within power systems and critical infrastructure protection. 
For the purpose of comparative analysis, we choose the three open source HIPS solutions or HIPS products, uh, ReHIPS, Komodo Internet Security and Deep Security Solution. The obtained results of comparative analysis clearly demonstrate that Deep Security Solution is the most resource demanding. The main reason for this uh, is that uh, Deep Security Solution has uh, activated web interface in default. Also, based on the obtained results, we can say that the lowest usage of system resources had a Rehips solution and it's applicable to use in power system uh, equipment or power system infrastructure. That's all of my presentation. Thank you for your attention and have a good day.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tomáš Svoboda. I am from Faculty of Informatics and Management, University of Hradec Králové in Czech Republic. And I will talk about our paper uh, about behavioral analysis of CM solutions for energy technology systems. This presentation consists of three major parts. In the first part, we will talk about energy technology system introduction with emphasis on data security and activity monitoring, uh, especially the use of uh, system solutions and user behavioral analysis. In the second part, I will talk about our proposal, uh, our proposed comparative analysis, which is based on uh, user-defined use case, which can uh, propose to uh, uh, user behavioral analysis modules tests in the CM solutions. And also, I will show you our obtained results and conclusion at the end of my presentation. So, nowadays the energy systems are systems that are used for power system management or voice communication system. And they are also used in management process of power systems. These systems are critical in terms of securing power supplies from the producer to final customer and have a major economic impact on the functioning of modern society as a whole. In order to ensure reliable say, electricity supply, the confidentiality, availability and integrity of the data that is critical to ensuring the correct operation of the power system must be ensured for these systems. And also the energy technology systems have been vulnerable for decades. Uh, this figure uh, depicts the three major areas of uh, energy systems. Uh, the first area uh, uh, is a uh, area of substations. The second area is the uh, area of uh, communication networks or one networks and the third area is a control center which is used to control and operate the electricity uh, as a as a whole so to avoid or mitigate the cyber attack well, which targets the physical damage to the equipment should be thoroughly monitor and control the access of all people to the technology rooms where they are located. Also it's necessary to use tools that are cap capable of monitoring, logging and auditing industrial control systems, communications and security features. IT support systems and also access control systems so that in the event of disruption they provide as much available information as possible to detect the attacker. The security, one of uh, applicable security solutions for this is user entity behavioral analysis. These functions are applicable into the uh, security uh, incident and event management systems. Historically, the principles of user behavioral analysis have been developed primarily for use in marketing to predict customer buying behavior. Uh, user entity behavioral analysis is based on threat detection for employees or system vendors and also 
this module looks for behavior patterns that are then applied to statistical analysis and algorithms to detect anomalies in relation to standard behavior. For these reasons, we decided to provide comparative analysis of uh, user entity behavioral analysis modules in uh, CM solutions. So for this purpose, we choose three uh, different CM solutions. It's uh, IBM QRadar, Logarithm and Alien World OSS IM. Also, for our proposed methodology, we uh, built the two cases in uh, which uh, was tested in selected CM solutions. So, in the first case, we tested the uh, incorrect authentication. The process of incorrectly entering authentication data may not indicate the possibility of attacking the infrastructure if the user mistakenly enters the password. But on the other hand, in the case of frequent occurrence of incorrect input of user authentication data, this activity can be the reason for this suspected unauthorized access to the infrastructure. So in the first step, we created a rule to ensure the dete detect this activity. After running wizard in IBM's uh, in IBM Curadar, a rule was generated. A rule is then applied and an event specified is detected. In addition, a text explaining the use case is displayed. In the user activity schedule, there is apparent an increase in the sense score associated with login failure activity and related activities that were invoked along with the login failure activity. The end result of entire use case is the generation of a security incident pointing to the very risky behavior of the user. In the second step, we apply the same use case, uh, respectively the same functionality in logarithm CM solution. In logarithm, we can make uh, cases. So this kind of case was used to create the correlation rule. The re relation rule was set with the same parameters as the QRadar use case. The rule is applied when an event specified as authentication failure is detected. For the purpose of testing the rule created, an unsuccessful user login event has been invoked. This activity was detected by the rule just as in the case QRadar solution and the user risk score was increased according to the parameters defined in the rule. As with QRadar, the detected activity is listed as well as related activities that were invoked along with login failure activity. Equally to the use of QRadar, the only output of the entire use case is the generation of a security incident pointing to the highly risky behavior of the user. In the first step, we create the use case to detect the permission delegation. Activity is detected that records an event of adding or removing a user to a security group when a user who has performed this activity do not, do not, does not have administrator privileges 
a security incident is generated to indicate this activity. So after creating the rule, an action was taken to add a normal domain user to a domain administrator group that had been performed by the source user. Based on the detected event, the risk score of this user was increased. In the fourth step, we implement this use case in logarithm same solution with the use of AI engine module. And for the relation rule was set with the same parameters as the case of QRadar use case. After creating a rule, an action to add a normal domain user to the domain admin group was made by the user. This activity was detected as well as in QRadar solution and the user risk score was immediately increased, which was immediately visible in application. Same as in the case of the use QRadar, is the only output case of entire use case of generating a security incident pointing to highly risky behavior of the user. So based on these results, we can say that we propose the comparative analysis of CM solutions. As I said before, we chose the three CM solutions, IBM Curadar, Logarithm and Alien Vault, but uh, we can say that Alien Vault uh, CM solution has no user entity behavioral analysis module and these kind of functionalities. So we didn't work with this solution in comparative analysis. The second solution that, we, that have been tested is uh, IBM QRadar and based on the results we can say that the uh, QRadar it's possible to track detailed information about users because uh, this solution has uh, built-in cases and also the license of user entity behavior analysis is uh, inside the solution. On the other hand, the third uh, CM solution logarithm is also possible to track detailed information about users in user entity behavior analysis in logarithm as well uh, as QRA data. Logarithm has uh, built-in cases, but you can uh, make your own use cases and also playbooks. The playbooks in includes the ability to add related activities to security incidents that are related to user activity. So this functionality giving use case the ability to compile a detailed overview of the origin of activities and their impact on infrastructure. But on the other hand, Logarithm has uh, extra licensing of user entity behavioral analysis module. So that's all. Thank you for your attention and uh, have a good day.
Dear uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Anna Švacová. I represent uh, Faculty uh, Informatic and Management of University Hradec Králové. The topic of my talk is uh, Treat Efficiency Analysis of Selected Systems. I'm going to divide this talk into four parts. Introduction, methodology, testing results, and conclusion. In the SCADA systems used the Microsoft Windows 7, this system is outdated and his support ended at 14.1.2020. In industrial systems, it will be performing necessary to upgrade the operation systems to a height version. For the upgrade, can choose uh, when Windows Desert or Zoom in the uh, 46 byte professional edition. Uh, for selecting the appropriate version of the Operation systems is very efficiency uh, that the suitability for use has assessed single treating and um, now let's start uh, by looking uh, at uh, methodology. Uh, uh, two computer configuration for testing of treats use efficiency in Microsoft uh, Windows. Uh, where first computer was in the configuration uh, 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 configuration uh, we uh, see uh, configuration one uh, is uh, uh, left and second second computer uh, was in the configuration uh, configuration uh, writes uh, uh, Rights uh, on the on the on the slide. Uh, these configurations represent standard laboratory equipment in laboratory of, of operating systems and computer network at uh, Faculty Informatic and Management of University Hradec Králové. For the testing purpose, uh, Microsoft Windows Seven. Uh, Windows 8 and uh, Windows 10 uh, professional in the 46-bit uh, edition were used. For the testing of treat usage efficiency in Microsoft Windows operation systems, third party application that can be used for uh, testing tos tasking in single treating and multi-treating modes uh, were used. They were cho chosen application utilities, 7-zip, uh, uh, WinRAR, uh, CPU, Z, Cinebench, and uh, AIDA46 CPU test. The guarded data was uh, processed Assist, uh, using standard descriptive statistical methods. Arithmetic mean, variance, and standard deviation were determined to so the guarded data could be relevantly evaluated. Now, uh, let's move on to part with name uh, testing results. For the testing internal performance benchmark that test compression and decompression speed in a kilobyte for second was used. The testing was repeated 30 times using one uh, 28 megabyte dictionary size. Uh, the application uh, for testing was uh, uh, WinRAR. The utilities is very similar as 7-zip. The tests were uh, run using single and all available CPU trees. The testing was repeated 30 times using 
128 megabyte dictionary size. <laughs> and now uh, here we can see a comparison between first configuration and uh, second configuration uh, computers. And now uh, we see next one results testing CPU Z application. This utility is freeware and gather information on some of the main systems device. The testing results are measured in points, with more points meaning better results. The testing was repeated 30 times. Here uh, we can uh, see a comparison between first com com configuration and uh, second configuration on, on the picture. Uh, let's move on to next. Uh, on the slide, I uh, uh, can see results testing for utilities Cinebench. This utilities is software for testing graphical rendering the CPU in single threading and multi threading modes. The testing results are measured in points with more points meaning better results. The testing uh, was repeated 30 times. Uh, and next slide, see how results testing of AIDA. AIDA use all available threads for the testing where enabled simultaneous multi-threading and hyper-threading and where CPU queen module used. The CPU queen module finds the solution for the classic queen's problems. One a 10 by 10 sized chessboard. CPU slip measures the performance of processors, subsystem, and memory combined using the public library slip for compressions. The delay last test was performed using AES CPU hash, which measured the CPU performance using SHA1 algorithm. Uh, we see uh, 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 results uh, for uh, testing AIDA. And now that brings us to the conclusion. Uh, if I can just summarize the main points. From the gathered data, it's unequivocally clear that all the three Microsoft Windows versions had shown minimum deviations. I can state the efficiency of treats. Utilization is the same in all operating systems. Operating system 7 can we upgrade of Windows 8 or Windows 10 because uh, efficiency, single treating and multi treating would be without change. This is all. Thank you for your attention. If you have any have any questions, please ask me. I would like to answer your questions.
Dear ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce myself. My name is Hanna Švecová. I represent Faculty Informatics and Management of University Hradec Králové. The topic of my talk is an architecture for intelligent e-learning platform from students' lab deployment. I am going to divide this talk into six parts. Introduction, problem definition, system input and requirements, system architecture, proof of concept lab deployment systems and conclusion. For effective teaching, it's appropriate to use laboratory that has different teaching for teachers and students. Many universities and organizations are solving the problem of implementing a such tablet platform for teaching. The design of new architectures for effective teaching using cloud, serv cloud services solves this problem. Let's start by looking at problem definition. We distinguish two phases of the learning process. Learning the theoretical aspects, learning the practical aspects and exercise. Students first learn the basic knowledge. They should subsequently demonstrate and deepen within exercise that should help them with the application of acquired knowledge. There are many possibilities for practical learning. The cloud platform is the most most efficient. Lab environment should meet requests in many areas. Areas can include for example, availability, accessibility, performance, and price. Laboratories may vary by type of school. The laboratory's environment will be different for students in school. Area will be different for the students in business area. This research, research is defining architecture for a real deployment of solution for lab deployment, but there should be analyzed specific environment setup and its requirement. This solution should be used for teaching information technology. Between these subject and technologies belong desktop and server operation system, Ubuntu and Windows Server client, and platforms run off top of these technologies. Virtualization platform like virtual machine and container virtualization, for example, VMware virtualization and Hyper-V. Application where is not easily to run, deploy it standalone machine uh, databases, application based on the backend and frontend layers, large enterprise systems and platforms, and many others. The designed environment can be able to run on private and also public cloud computing solution. Let's take a look at the picture. We see uh, picture 3 solution to cloud services. Public cloud solution, hybrid cloud solution, private cloud solution. This services solution can be used in various combinations. Now, let's move on to other part systems, input and requirements. The architecture of the solution should effectively serve the purpose which is mainly students learning. Because of this, students should be able to use it any time and also should be able to rebound and or skip the environment to any state of course. From the requirement, there are implicated systems inputs for particular usage of this architecture. There should be include and consider the right above all. How many users will be active have deployment lab inactive be able to deploy lab or how many labs can each user deploy and 
how user will connect of the environment. If there is needed some VPN, another external portal or is public internet available? And how much will be used automation for deployment and which configuration will be one user site? Now let's move on to part with name system architecture. In the picture is basic architecture concept. This concept is consist part of a system for deployment of student, students' environments and these components are important for successful implementation and working setup of this architecture. On the picture, we see three basics, additional services, control plate and data plane. New system architecture include configuration systems. The configuration system performs our e-learning event portal and connects automation. Artifactory system connects automation and data plane lab deployment together. The whole system consists of three components, which each acquire subsystems of this solution and have its own meaning. These components are split into parts. Control plane, which takes care of the whole platform. Data plane, where run students deploy. The boot part can are running of cloud services. For testing purpose, they were create basic web portal and to which basic form for creation, creation of students lab. This lab has two alternatives, uh, three and six virtual machine based on Ubuntu uh, 18.4.2 LTS Bionic Beaver with installed and configured basis Kubernetes cluster. Artifact system stored Ubuntu images and also some repositories in the right code software where has been a store pipeline configuration for Jenkins automation server. Jenkins has, has been used like automation system with a right pipeline which received TIGR from e-learning the portal, which configuration start by plan run, which deployed students. Now that brings us to the conclusion. Now if I can, sum, I can just summarize the main point, post. This architecture con concept, concept can be used in large usage variants and thanks to this can be modified on specific environment requirements and possibilities. The main benefit of this architecture in the opening is for future development. And here are possibilities to change and or modify it for the needs of the specific organization. Thank you for attention. I if you have any questions, please ask me. I, I would like to answer your questions.
First, I would like to thank for the organizer inviting me to this conference to be a you know, speaker. Uh, my name is Payung Misad. I am a, an associate professor from Faculty of Information Technology and Digital Innovation at King Mungkut University of Technology, North Bangkok, Thailand. My talk today is on trends and challenges in big data analytics. So at the end of today, first we will we'll talk about big data and go to big data tools like Hadoop and Hadoop ecosystem. And we'll be about the uh, data analytics and the tool on artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning. Uh, focus on some uh, deep learning like convolutional neural network, recurrent network, long short term memory neural network, gated recurrent unit, attention mechanism, and transformers model. Then we talk about the trends and challenges in big data, knowledge discovery in big data, and application framework, then give some conclusion. Uh, Talk about the big data. So there are many data alive from IoT and also like a uh, user generators from Facebook, from Twitter, and many many uh, un and, uh, organization that produce data by the users, right? The worker can produce, and now we come a lot of data. So large amount of data of the volume of, the, of data become big and big, right? So it's difficult to handle big data. Also, not only the size of data is big, also the velocity, the speed of how it uh, creates, right? The data from IoT going really fast. So how we capture with the streaming data, those kind of things, so speed uh, is challenge. Also, the data is come with a lot of type, right? Kind of variety uh, of sources, heterogeneous sources. Some data is like structured, some unstructured, some semi-structured. So, how to handle those kind of data? That's that's another another challenge. Uh, that uh, data also kind of vary, right? Variability of the data kind of changing, you know, fluctuate. So how can we deal with that? That's you know, another challenge in big data. Also, validity uh, is kind of concerned with the quality of data. 
right? They don't have some quality itself. So how can we make uh, the good out of that? How can we make data of content the quality? Sometimes we have noise. How can we can do with, with this kind of uh, big data issue? And also the visualization also important. Right? With small data, we could do uh, visualization really easily. But when we have a large amount of data, speed of the data, how can we do the visualization? And also the value that hidden inside the big data, the knowledge that hidden inside. How can we draw and get some knowledge from that? Those kind of things. So this become like seven V in big data challenges for the developer to think about. Uh, in big data, in the past, it's quite difficult to handle. It kind of difficult uh, to do processing. But from the last five to ten years, from uh, there have been a tool like a Hadoop that uh, help in order to elevate those kinds of problem. Hadoop is a technique that uh, is a tool in order to distribute the data. The big data uh, can be distributed into a uh, uh, small uh, data, small blocks of data from big files separated into small files and distributed into data node, right? So uh, it's not only distributed, but it's also make uh, copies, right? So in doing that, in doing so, when we have some problem, like some failure of some data node or some part of a uh, cluster computer, then we can really call back the remainder, right? So that mechanism is make Hadoop really stable, right? So it, it almost never failure because it's a way come back. So Hadoop does just a technique like a Hadoop file, uh, Hadoop file system, and also have to map reduce in order to map the data, right? Processing and reduce, collect back the result. And Hadoop also comes with uh, a lot of tools in the ecosystem. Uh, the one start in uh, 2007 is a Hadoop itself, Hadoop file, distributed file system. This one is the distributed file system that for like uh, reliability, storage, huge amounts of unstructured, semi-structured, uh, structured data in the form of files. And the same year, come in the, the package also have uh, Hadoop MapReduce. It, this one is a distributed algorithm framework for doing a parallel processing of the last data set on the HDFS file system. It runs on Hadoop cluster, but also supports uh, other database uh, format like uh, Cassandra and DSPS and the others. And the Cassandra itself it come from uh, in the about 2008, it's a key value pair, NoSQL database, with a column family data representation and a synchronous masterless replication. Also, the same year, HBase, Apache HBase is a key value pair, NoSQL database with column families, file data representation with a master slave. Uh, replication. It uses HTTPS as underlying storage. And also, same year, in 2008, so Keep Alive is a distributed coordination service for distributed application. This is based on uh, PaxOSC algorithm valence call SAP. In 2009, Apache Peak Alive, this one is, is a kind of skipping interface over the map reduce. Uh, it's kind of some people uh, they're not familiar with or not uh, cannot use like map reduce in terms of Java. Then can just skipping is more maybe easier. So pick can devolve a lot of big data very easily. Also in two thousand nine Hive is a SQL interface over the map reduce for uh, developer and analysis analysts who prefer SQL interface over uh, native Java MapReduce program. So I have this kind of the tool that make it like a big data, something like that. And like 
in terms of make it easier for people who are already familiar with Sikwa. Also in 2009, Apache Mahout, which is a library for machine learning algorithm, is implemented on top of MapReduce also for finding like meaningful patterns and machine learning models over the uh, ATPS data set. In 2009 also has uh, MongoDB. This one is a general purpose document-based distributed database. It's kind of NoSQL database. It's kind of more productive to use for modern app, uh, application developer. In 2010, there's a scoop. Scoop is a tool to import data from RDBMS data warehouse and move to uh, the HDFS and HSPED also export back to uh, the uh, DBMS. In 2011, the uh, Hadoop Jan, uh, yes, another resort negotiator, is kind of a system to uh, do its scheduling application and services on the HDFS cluster. It's many the cluster resources like memory, CPU, and something like that. In 2011, is a tool called FOOM. The FOOM is a tool to collect, aggregate, uh, reliably move, and ingest a large amount of data into HTTPS. So when we have a big log file, right, FOOM can help uh, collect kind of exact time from load very quickly. Uh, same year, STORM. STORM is a system to process a high velocity streaming data with at least one message uh, semantics. So when we have steaming data, STORM will help very easily. In 2012, there's Apache Spark. Spark is an in-memory data processing engine that can run uh, the edge of the operation. It provides a library for machine learning, uh, SQL interface, and near real-time streaming. Same year in 2012, there's a Kafka. Kafka is a distributed messaging system with a partition topic for a very high scalability. And also the same year in 2012, there's a Apache Solar, Solar Cloud, which is a distributed search engine with a REST-like interface for full text search. It uses Lucent library for data indexing. That's a search tool in big data. Uh, in 2015, there is a Apache Airflow. This one is organized and complex computational work processes and data handling pipeline. So there are many tools in Hadoop ecosystem that can help to manage to uh, digest the data to break down and to help analyze the data faster. I would like to focus a little bit on Apache Spark Apache Spark is a very really hot, top, hot uh, tools, and a lot of big companies have been using this technique, uh, technology. So Spark is a technology used to analyze big data. It's, it's a high performance for both batch and streaming data using state-of-the-art uh, direct acyclic club uh, DHG uh, scheduler, a QL optimizer, and a physical execution engine. It runs uh, 10 times faster than MapReduce and Hadoop. It can be uh, applied quickly, right? Can use like Java, Scala, Python, R, uh, and SQL. So, so there are many tools to, to do, uh, can use with Spark. Spark also is kind of generality. It combines SQL uh, streaming and complex analytics. Stack power with a stack of libraries, including SQL Data Frame, MLibs for machine learning, GlabX for Glab, and Spark Streaming for data streaming. You can combine these libraries seamlessly in the same application. And Spark can run everywhere. Spark can run on Hadoop, Cassandra, Mesod, Hesbase, Kubernetes, and so on. Okay, then now we have seen that a lot of tools that help to digest big data 
it's possible to, to handle easier, much more easier, and we have many, many uh, open source tools for that, to do data analytics. And what is data analytics? Data analytics is the exploration of historical data from many source systems through statistical analysis, quantitative analysis, data mining, predictive modeling, and other technologies and techniques to identify trends and understanding the information that can drive business change and support sustained successful business practice. So doing analysis, there are many things, but we will have to focus on what is a trend now is this AI, right? AI is an artificial intelligence, which is the intelligence demonstrated by machines. Doing that, machine, AI have subset of machine learning. It is a computer code program, a computer algorithm that improves automatically through experience from train data, training data. And also the deep learning is the hot topic now. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning with a structure, a structural model that mimics neurons in human brain. This is itself is a artificial neural network, ANN. Talk a bit more about machine learning. Machine learning is a computable uh, algorithm capable of learning to build a prediction model based on training data. There are many kinds of learning type, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, semi-supervised learning, reinforcement learning. Supervised learning, we have to have the data input and target to uh, modify the model to adapt to learning or the learning process. For unsupervised learning type, we, ha we don't have the target. We have just only data. The machine learning have to be able to, to learn to class I mean, uh, clustering the data to find the, the similarity of the data. The same is supervised learning, combine supervised learning with the unsupervised learning. And reinforcement learning is used in uh, low board game theory. Uh, this kind of thing, this kind of learning also no target of the input data, but we have to go to go to the move on place to another place based on uh, reinforcement uh, mechanism. There are a lot of big applications of machine learning, like uh, email filtering, computer vision, image classification, sentiment analysis, natural language understanding, chatbot, and so on. Now, talking about neuron, in the human brain, we have like 100 billion cells, neuron cells inside, but when we pick up only one cell of neuron, neuron is composed of dendrite, synapse, we have soma and exon. When we model of the, this one neuron. So what we have uh, two input, where the dendrite is just input X1, X2 uh, coming to the neuron. Uh, synapse can represent as a weight, with one, with two. Uh, B also kind of synapse, special with the uh, input fixed to be one. And the uh, SOMA is just can uh, collect the data, so we can represent like a summation of the data. And then now we have axon. Axon is like activation function. So this guy we have the threshold function. And when we calculate n, n equal to w1 multiplied by x1 plus w2 multiplied by x2 plus b multiplied by 1, so that we have this equation as n, and then feed to the activation function is like goes to x1. And then we have a output from the neuron is a function of uh, weight multiplied x input plus b, right? And this equation, the end, if we set to zero, then it is just that a linear line. Right? It's just a linear equation. It's mean when we have a linear line, you can separate into data into two sides, one and zero. Yeah. The, the linear line or the boundary of the uh, up to area of data is has a relationship to the weight. Right? The weight is always start at the original zero, zero, and then point to one. Uh, at the location of W1, W2. And this direction of weight is always perpendicular to the boundary. Right? So we can have any value of weight in this selection and create this boundary. And B, the bias, is the way that we can move 
uh, up or down along the weight axis there. So when we have more and more neuron, more and more neuron, then we can create a body much more complex instead of line, but can be curvature. And if we had more, uh, more layer, it could be more complex in terms of nonlinear mapping, right, from x input to y output. And we could have a lot of hidden neurons that has become deep multi-layer perceptron. And this can be function as a classification, function approximation, regression, and so on. Depends on what data we have uh, prepared to train this network. And the way we find the weight, right, we use the weight optimization, is based on the error. The function error is uh, this one over two summation one to k, e k square. So e, our error is the difference between the target and the output, right? We, and we squared it because we have to raise up, make it uh, not non-zero, non-negative. Non so it's always a positive value. So we like to, to minimize this function error. But when we vary the, the weight, the output A will vary also, and the weight, I uh, mean the, the error also uh, vary, but it depends on the weight and bias. But we would like to find the minimum error, so the set of weight and bias is at this point. Right? By doing that, when we start in some point, we have to move down, move the weight until we got to the optimum point. So we have to move down the sloped, uh, what we call gradient, right? That is a, uh, in the area that we would like to, every step we have to reduce error. And we update the weight based on this equation. New weight equal to the previous weight uh, plus the learning rate multiplied the gradient, the negative of gradient, and multiply to the, the previous weight. And now we can update the weight of the neural network. And if we have like many layers, we could update the weight. But before we update, we have to fit in, prepare the training data. We fit in X and we call, uh, calculate output for each layer, right? And we have, until the output, we have Y. And that Y, compared to the target, we have the error. And that we would like to minimize it. And if we differentiate this equation, we got the gradient. And we, we move, update the weight. Every time we update it into the direction, the opposite direction of the gradient, while we're going down. Right, so this become the update weight. And because we have a lot of layers, then we need to use chain rule in order to propagate backpropagation, right? That is the name of the backpropagation learning. So that way we have been using uh, to optimize the weights and biases. Uh, next neural network it, in deep learning is a convolutional neural network. It is this very famous in um, learning things for uh, in the area of image processing, but there are a lot of application in image processing. Right? This comes from that it observed that when we looking things something right, we looking at image, just only on the the which what you call text on the back, they connect to the the eyes, so we don't have to connect everything on the, in the brain. Right? So that's it, um, reduce some computation part of. Uh, in order to see things like that. So convolutional neural network on CNN composed of the input layer, and we have uh, feature learning layers. A uh, feature learning layer composed of convolution mechanism, the cal calculation by moving, uh, moving to see some part of image, and uh, pooling, uh, go to pooling, and do again convolutional, uh, little pooling, and again and again. And the feature learning will capture some patterns of cat and dog and how make it different, right? So now we feed, uh, flatten this image into uh, one vector and feed into multi-layer perceptron as just has in previous slides. This part doing uh, learning the classification, okay, what kind of pattern we cat, dog, and pig cow. Another application a recurrent network is uh, uh, the, when we have the application like a, 
uh, natural language processing or time series analysis. Neural network cannot capture the dependency, but recurrent, right? We have to feed back some state and feed input again. And just in doing this uh, feed recurrent back, it kind of capture dependency of uh, the sequence of data. Like xt is a data as time t, xt minus one is the previous step, and minus two is another step. In, in that sense, we, we capture uh, on the dependency. So it means that we, we can capture on the sentences of a, sp a spoken language or the time series data. And uh, standard C and uh, I and then we apply in like a lot of application. Right? Any kind of sequence data or natural language processing can, can apply. But usually the INN itself has uh, the gradient problem. It can be when we web propagate back, mm -hmm. we multiply gradient many times right, in the time step. If we have a long step of time and the gradient is too small, if it's close to zero, in multiplication become vanishing. But if we have the gradient is larger than one, when you multiply many times, it also explodes. Then the, and that problem has been solved by long short term memory uh, by implementing some forget gate, input gate, and output gate to control those signals and become uh, so the vanishing and, and uh, exploding problem. But the uh, long short term memory still have some the problem. Because when we have very long period of sequences, it cannot remember, actually. It's just a very short window of, of uh, sentences. It cannot uh, remember the whole page of, or the whole book of stories, something like that. And because it has a lot of parameters, and it takes a very long time. Then the gated legal and units uh, try to reduce that problem because uh, it takes a long time to update in our SCM. Then the gated, uh, gated recurrent unit or GIU will have only uh, reset, <coughs> reset gate and update gate and have few parameters. Then it's faster to train. And however, it kind of still has the same problem of the, the length of window that uh, cannot remember the previous data. Uh, and, and also when we doing a uh, big data or a large amount of data, then it's very complex. Then we have to stack uh, more and more our SEM or GRU or our and then layers. So it makes even longer time to train, very complex to train. However, it can apply in like language model. Right? We, in language model, in in type, our SEM, GRU is the same type. Right. We have X represent as a token or words, and Y is a output, right? So we use apply submax to build, multiply ST, we got the Y, and the ST is a memory computed from past memory and current. So, so, so far, it has been a lot of people using I and type recurrent, and it's kind of exciting for a while, but still, I can start with some uh, some amount of length of window is not uh, capture very long length of uh, sequence data. And apply in like sentiment analysis. Uh, the sentiment analysis is uh, where we identify the, the mood or subjective opinions within a large amount of text, including some average sentiments or opinion mining. Right? We, we fit in the input and it can classify into positive and negative by uh, applying the long short term memory or uh, IN or GRU. Another application like a machine translation model is that we have encoder and decoder. And the encoder will receive some language. I right? still love data science. At, at the decoder, we decode to some language like Thai or, or Vietnamese or anything. Uh, another application in like a Conversion, conversation model like a chatbot. Right? We, uh, we have some someone talk, uh, how are you? And then another guy says, respond, I am fine, thank you, something like that. 
So this chatbot console really hot topic in every domain uh, services business. But uh, using the previous model, like I uh, and family, like uh, LSTM, GRU, dot kind of thing, it's kind of uh, very promising, but it still have some limitation of the window length. So here come another te uh, technique called attention mechanism uh, in this paper in about 2017. Attention is the way I think about it. We just focus on some, some part, not try to remember the whole thing, as in uh, LCM or JIN. So we just, if we focus on something, pay attention to that. Then they have uh, the key of the uh, key list, key and values, and they calculate like a scale dot product attention. Uh, the QLE is like when we, we QLE into database system, right? We QLE thing and we return back something. And in that, they uh, have a mechanism to multiply, the mathematics multiply QLE and the keys. And we got the scale uh, and then go past to the masking, pay some attention to that. And uh, you apply to softmax and then uh, met more with the uh, values and then that's get the signal at a scale dot product attention. And so also they propose uh, multi head attention. QLE key values uh, go to linear and then go to scale dot product attention and concatenate together go to uh, linear or uh, multi head attention to that. So in detail have to go to see in this paper in more detail, but the attention has been applied to many uh, any works. And for example, in transformer in this paper, same paper, this one uh, have the transformer that when we feed uh, some input, it go parallelly to the transformer and produce the output like to respond with something. I'm fine, thank you. Or you can be applied to any language model, right? So it make it faster, and no need to have like a, a really step by step like LSTM. Okay, and from not far from that's two years from uh, the attention transformer, then Google have proposed the bidirectional encoder representation from transformer or call BERT. Uh, this BERT. They have retained and used a lot of machine and wrote about 4 billion work caps and, and pre-trained into the model of the transformer, right? And after that, we can fine tune to apply to any new application based on this board, right? like question answering uh, application and so on, right? But they are using some kind of unlabeled sentences, like uh, unsurprised thing and have some uh, mechanism. You can see the paper uh, in this one. Okay, the trend and challenge are big data then. So we have many tools at the moment and the trend is very challenging. It's smarter and smarter in, in machine learning. And now we have also really, uh, uh, a lot of data. And then the challenge is that what, for data engineering, how can we capture the data that fit in how we store as a big data? and how can we deal with data source that come many, many sources. We know we have a lot of tools and how we make it uh, come together and apply it in a real uh, application. In data management also, like searching, sharing, tran uh, transferring, visualization, queuing, updating, information privacy and security. So this is an uh, issue that need to uh, uh, to make, uh, to propose or to make it works, right, in the real application. And in data analytics, data analysis analytics, like to build artificial intelligence after we have big data, okay, how to make it zero use, how to uh, model machine learning, like uh, in deep learning, more particular, and what are the application that we, we could employ the big data and data analytics. That's the limit for our challenges. There's some uh, framework that we could do, like no less that recovery from big data. And when we have a slot from IoT and any kind of data sources, right, 
from image from uh, any IoT thing, then we need, need to prepare the storage right in the uh, HDFS Hadoop. Hadoop uh, HDFS would be one of the solution uh, to uh, store the data in distributed uh, cluster. And to store like that, we have to extract hand from load, maybe apply some tools like Scoop, Airflow, Hive, Kafka, or any others that do extract hand from load. And then we can use uh, the data HTTPS to feed to the next uh, layer as uh, data analytics, which is we can do apply uh, Spark. Spark is the kind of tool for analyze the big data. We can write a code in terms of machine learning uh, in order to uh, draw the data from HTTPS. And then we come up with some knowledge. We can apply to uh, the recommendation software dashboard or we have some rule in order to make decision. And any some others like uh, predictive models that can be resolved from that data analytics. And an application could be like business, uh, business finances, education, government, international development, industry manu manufacturing, insurance, healthcare, uh, medical, uh, media entertainment, military, and so on. And many kind of application like movie recommendation, machine translation, robot control, time silly prediction, speech recognition, speed synthesis, time silly anomaly detection, grammar learning, and writing recognition, human action record, uh, recognition, protein homology detection, and so on. Okay, in, in uh, conclusion, so we have talked about a big data. There have like, like a big problem challenges, then we have tools to deal with the big data, like, uh, like Hadoop, MapReduce, Spark, and not a Hadoop ecosystem. Big data have some challenges in storage, management, analysis, analytics, and also a challenge in uh, build deep learning technology. We can use between N and then LST, MGIU, and now moving to attention, uh, transformer, and BERT. Uh, a lot of application trend from our big data that uh, far ahead. So I hope you have some uh, idea on what is uh, the trend and challenge on big data. And thank you very much for your attention.
major impact networking theory is content type of original peer review chapter reporting on new development of interest to the nature inspired networking community and community communities. On chapter content remarkable to big of nature inspired networking from theory to application for nature inspired networking based on rigorous either disciplinary approaches in which theoretical contribution has been formally stated and certified and the practical application have been based on their form for basic the book is a reference for the reader who already have a basic understanding of the book are now ready to know how to use the reverse approaches to develop networking that's inspired by nature. Chapters were carefully selected to, on one hand, cover a broad spectrum of, of formal and practical aspects, and on the other hand, a kind as much as possible in a shell content book. The content of the talk consists of the following section Introduction, Content of the book, Remarkable Feature of the book, and Review and Testimonials. A new networking paradigm is seen as a, a, a cutting edge approach to networks, equally a priority research area, nature by networking. Appreciated as need, which in by from nature, that biological, social, and physical phenomena. The book is a place for highly original idea about how the nature is going to shape the networking system of the futures, and it focuses on theory and application, which encompass rigorous approaches and the execution that take inspiration from nature for the development of novel problem so the technique to the end you take advantage of a more engineering method and establish in this book for more and practical aspect of need to archive for reason and practice of need. The book we refer to cover of the book it's a re reference for reader who already have a basic understanding of the working and now ready to know how to use a regular approaches to develop the working that's implied by nature and the book includes work theoretical contribution and report on application to keep a, re a, reasonable, a reasonable Trend up between theoretical and practical issues. Chapter was carefully selected to, on one hand, cover a broad spectrum of formal and practical aspect, and on the other hand, a kind of aspect as possible in shared book, formal and practical aspect, our example in a straightforward fashion. But discussion in detail the necessary component of repeat touching on the more advanced advanced to it. Therefore, 
theory and application doing treating how to use the formal measuring method for needs. You will try using sound judgment and reasonable certification. This book which chapter contributed by prominent researchers from academia and industry we serve as a technique. Technical guides and reference material for engineer, scientist, practitioner, and researcher, avoiding them with severe research, adding and future opportunity and trends. These contributions include state of the art architecture, protocol technique, technology, and application in need. In particular, the book covers existing and emerging research issue in need. The book has nine chapters addressing various topics from theory to application of need based on rigorous interdisciplinary approaches. Then other book Chapter mm-hmm. One written by Phong Wen Consider Cell Star as a foundation for autonomic computing. The notion of autonomic computing and cell star so serve as a basic on which to build the intuition about algebraic aspect of autonomic system in general. In this chapter, author specify autonomic system and self star and then move on to consider some universal construction such as product, product, create, self star action, finite limit limit of autonomic system and one eye of set action. On this material is taken as an investigation of the algebraic aspect of autonomic system. Chapter 2 written by GT and others review the most relevant bio things by routing and cluttering approaches with a special focus on vehicle scenario. The underlying concept of mobile group management is adopted to select the more suited scheme among which are the A and B colonial organization and factor material life cycle. Finally, the practical issue related to protocol design are uh, investigated, investigated by relying on factory trio quorum sensing mechanism. We seem to be a promising approach to this design decentralized and flexible joint cluttering and routing scheme while archiving a uh, food protect awareness. Chapter 3, written by Sanchez Garcia and others, indicate that nowadays nature is one algorithm can be applied to many fields and provide optimal or pseudo-optimal solution to many different optimization problems. Is that a scenario which presents a highly dynamic nature and one of these area of application that can benefit from nature is by algorithm. Especially mobile ad hoc network, which are envisioned to be deployed in disaster 
skenario presents several, several aspects that need to be addressed with flexibility, accuracy, and, and efficiency. Nature and Brain Aneurysm presents the rewind character characteristic for efficiency efficiently dealing with the zero optimization problem related to multi hub ad hoc network in the disaster scenario. The author proposed the chapter for gathering and organizing the information about current work in this field. Chapter 4, written by RT and others focuses on exploring the synergy, de dependency, and common requirement between future internet and distributed system. Discuss discussing the re re relationship between both research area. It provides a detailed de de description of Nova Genesis and never challenges in this system. Furthermore, it addresses communication model, message of passing, naming, identification, address, addressing, locating issue, and other approaches for modeling distributed system and communication protocol under the, the concept of Nova Genesis. With this scope, the chapter will naturally touch on on work working, network management, visualization, internet, uh, thing, operation system, autonomic networking, awareness, evaluation networking, and even hardware solution. The contribution not only networking protocol and architecture, but also digital system and software engineering. Chapter 5, written by Ragnar's work and others, indicates that why collective intelligence is considered as a powerful approach to enhance decision, decision capability. Very few atoms have been made to utilize, utilize its potential in the computer network domain. This is intended to provide a zero overview of collective intelligence with a discussion on how it can be effectively applied in different areas of computer network. More study are required to inculcate the idea of collective intelligence in various area of the network. It's therefore very promising to identify opportunity for integration in incarnation of collective intelligent methodology, methodology and technology in to networking. It would rewind just the suitly cons considering the various activity in a collective network for this purpose. Such an effect would finally aim at remodeling the computer network in the tech of the tech collective intelligence. To the sick written by Alula present QoS routing algorithm for mobile ad hoc network appreciated as Manet 
which means online encoding, initialization and root serve using the zeratic algorithm. Appreciated as GA. Objective is to find the best QS route in order to optimize the design of my magnet routing protocol. This and we have a problem with often highly content so that random initialization and standardic operator using the invisible network. Another complicated question is that the fitness function involves calculating or not reliability of the root. A calculation does it the computationality as passive. Therefore, it's imperative that the search balance the need to truly explore the boundary between feasible and infeasible network along with calculating fitness. Only one the most providing high day route. Algorithm results are compared to the result of standard manage protocol without the GA search. Chapter 7 written by Shawari and others. Consider a demo network, which is a network where the flow functionality of a node dependent on temperatures. This model is inspired by several types of real life network and zero line some conventional network model wherein not a fixed capacity and the problem is maximize the flow through the network. In a thermal network, the temperatures of a not increase as traffic move through this and not maybe also good so the mostly over time or by employing cooling packet to problem of maximizing the flow from a source to sink analyze for both these cases for a holistic view with, re with respect to the single source single sink dynamic pro pro flow problem in the technical network chapter also study certain property that a thermal network exhibit and give close form solution to maximize flow that can can be applied through is to such a network. Chapter A written by city and all and other Yes, inspiration from biological brain for tolerant technique to make the work on chip appreciate as NOC. Communication reliable as a biological brain is highly robust and for tolerant brain try to work properly even if some neutron some neuron synapses and some other part of the brain is damaged. Send up send up to genesis and sprouting are to biological brain technique used in this chapter to implement the Cell adapt and cell handling concept in NLC. Early 
chapter 9, written by Sati and, and others. Is you, is you says, to broad category of QS parameter in NOC. Granted, to boot connection service abbreviated, abbreviated as CT. And best effort connection service abbreviated as BA. The bio expanded algorithm is implemented using this connection setup. The ZT connection are implemented using Thai division multiplexing abbreviated as TDM. TDM connection have divide the bandwidth of the interconnect among multiple connection using slot. BE connection are implemented using packet switching. In packet switching, routing design at which direction packet should be sent based on situation of neighbor route router interconnect and routing table. In this chapter, the bio XPy and OC algorithm using GT connection is because Remarkable feature of the book. The book has the following remarkable features. An advanced reference on nature inspired network. A technique guide on nature inspired network. State of the art solution using using in the field of nature network. Illustration in more easy reading and comprehension. Based on rewards and interdisciplinary approaches, in which theoretical contribution are formally stated and certified and graphical application based on the form or basic. The book serves as a comprehensive and essential reference on need and intended as a textbook for the senior graduate and graduate level courses. It is also used as a supplementary textbook for undergraduate courses. The book is useful resources for students and researchers for to learn need. In addition, it will be valuable to professional from both academy and and industry and generally as in turn appeal to people who would try to contribute to need to know this. We highly hope you enjoy reading the book. Review and testimonial. Nature inspired include properly speaking, bio inspired, physical inspired, social inspired, and so on. This book contains highly original contribution about how nature is going to shape the working system of the features. The book will be will usually serve as a technical guide and relevant material for engineer, scientists, practitioner, and researcher by providing them with state of the art research result and feature of opportunity and trends. To the best of my knowledge, this is 
one of the first book were present a common and firing of main reasons. This make the book unique and in more than one aspect, a truly valuable source, source of information that may be considered as a landmark in the progress of Nin. Thank you for your listening.
good morning one and all myself sanjay research scholar vishweshwara technological university regional center department of electronics and communication engineering vivekananda institute of technology here i am presenting my technical paper improved packet delivery for wireless sensor networks using local automata based autonomic network architecture in a zigbee environment under the guidance of dr shaila k professor department of electronics and communication engineering vivekananda institute of technology bengaluru as we move with that of wireless sensor networks always a user needs a low cost low power personal area network while designing this low cost low power personal area network most common way is using a zigbee wireless sensor network that always uses the network topology while using the network topology there exists congestion in the network and the congestion may be due to the large amount of energy consumed by each and every node between the source and the destination would be the major reason in such environments we are planning to involve a local automata based autonomic network architecture which always considers the previous occurrence of probabilities of nodes and learns their behavior during their transmission it also combines the local automata and address agnostic feature that controls congestion and improves throughput and also it leads to an increased unicast and multicast packet delivery on a whole on the whole it provides 20% increase in unicast and multicast delivery rates the complete overview of my presentation is with introduction related work pro- problem definition system and mathematical model simulation and performance evaluation conclusion and further references as we spoke regarding wireless sensor networks advances in micro sensing technology that lead to a considerable volume in the area of wireless sensor networks is in demand with the expanding modernity of remote co- correspondences and detecting advances different sensor based applications like industrial robotics and electromechanical mechanization is uh, a trend this creates enormous monetary and social implications as we go with broad investigation on wsn we need to dig more about zigbee standards the process requires backbone network with static environment and related nodes that are mobile and in few cases it may be immobile the information re- retrieved by each and every node in the network leads to a major cluster node which simultaneously receives supervisory message leading to a congestion in a tree structure as we speak with the next consideration of autonomic network architecture it mainly considers consists of four dependent parameters like sensor network application self configuring self healing self optimization self productivity stochastic p2p overlay as you look with the, the architecture of an autonomic network architecture where we have developed mac layer with ana which comprises these four components so with these four dependent parameters if it is self sensor network application its a disturbances occurred while changing mac structure with wsn that should not affect the built in applications of uh, wsn if it is with self configuring self healing then introducing ana there exists adaptive nature when intermediate nodes fails and reroutes through the shortest path with existing neighboring nodes furthermore with self optimization and self productivity means uh, it, it 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 refers to with respect to that of the distance and the network becomes more productivity and uh, finally the stochastic p2p overlay the occurrence of node at each successful transmission leads to consideration of probability in large density nodes this provides basics for stochastic point to point overlay as we continue with our uh, research uh, with mo- uh, the main motivation for going with uh, uh, kind of implementation is so in any real dy- time dynamic environment scenarios requires design complexity for congestion with unicast and multicast deliveries these involve designing of active and sleep modes of specific nodes at top layer of a network layer thus designing mac layer layer protocols is a primary concern and uh, on the other hand reliability is ap- appreciable during uh, lesser congestion D- due to congestion if delivery of packets is unfair it re- it it might results in uh, lower throughput thus while designing zigbee based application the designer has to address end user concern at low data rates 
and uh, with our con- contribution is concerned the integration of complex dynamic environment designed for us we can be achieved using learning automata based autonomic network architecture the packet delivery ratio is to be optimized in the dynamic environment at smaller space with larger density sensor nodes the design architecture is figured at lower part of the network layer of tcp bar ip protocol called mac layer as we uh, stick on with our uh, background work uh, basically a literature survey is concerned we have n number of things to be discussed where uh, the first reference gave us the multi rate selection and the second rate uh, second reference had provided us how to uh, cover the entire network covering with larger density nodes and with uh, uh, third and uh, four to seven references had given something uh, basically with uh, autonomicity and mathematical uh, relations uh, along with uh, some um, application related to healthcare monitoring systems and railway monitoring that are self uh, powered with the higher throughput and as we move further with 8 to 10 references mm, uh, with uh, reference 8 uh, mainly it is a cross layer design again but uh, not completely with autonomicity just only with uh, ana and with uh, 9 and 10 uh, it mainly gives us uh, the idea about multi packet reception uh, particularly in, do- in an indoor uh, dynamic environments and with 11 and 12 is concerned uh, the concept of coexistence and uh, the uh, uh, ba- uh, the module model based approach how to exactly uh, with uh, considering the shortest path or the device omission or uh, what would be the um, easiest way to do the things and uh, with 13 and 14 Uh, these uh, directly uh, say get has a uh, clear path about the robustness and uh, two layer design in zigbee environment so now coming to our problem definition the dynamic environment design using zigbee with transmission of large number of packets at comparable low rate can cause congestion this can be avoided by limiting unicast and multicast uh, delivery and uh, the objectives of our work is to implement the unicast and multicast at low trans- rate of transmission data rate tra- of transmission and uh, increasing throughput by considering the active and sleep nodes and finally with our assumption uh, we had combined the process of local automata and autonomic network architecture at one side and the other side is uh, we will be always taking the probability of occurrence of uh, both active and sleep nodes which is present in our route uh, so coming for the next thing that is system and mathematical model the trouble free network at large density with lower data rate is, rate is implemented using uh, la based ana architecture the architecture involves back pressure mechanism while calculating probability of occurrence of each node at an initial stage local automata process addresses at lower level of network layer that is a mac layer and this is uh, followed by autonomic architecture that involves an intermediate node and sync node with the data flow rate regulation this improves the overall packet delivery rate and supports unicast and multicast uh, deliveries during the low data rates thus network throughput is substantially increased with uh, lower fault tolerance levels uh, as we discussed with the mathematical model if i say p of n plus 1 is my uh, considered uh, probability of occurrence then we have from p of 1 to p of n plus 1 where p of 1 uh, representing my source and p of n plus 1 is my destination if there a, uh, if there exist any kind of error in in an intermediate node then uh, it is estimated as error node then e of n plus 1 will be p of n of i plus 1 minus p of n of j plus 1 where i and j uh, says the random position which is neighboring to the particular error node and uh, as with our uh, ana based environment is concerned for a particular node p of n um, we say um, Uh, p of i p of j and p of n plus 1 mean, means that shows as a clear picture about completing the la based ana architecture while root, routing larger packets in larger density dynamic environment as we go with the implementation we can we had uh, give you the sensor nodes which are distributed in a random environment uh, with uh, which are varied from 20 to 50 and it is self explanatory as we go with uh, the zigbee in network environment we just we had taken a particular nodes in that uh, from figure 1 and we had uh, indicated the sleep node active node and uh, how the path with multicast delivery and unicast delivery as we uh, move forward with respect to our implementation how exactly our uh, basically the algorithm flows with respect to la based ana architecture uh, we always start with the aod environment establishing an aod environment with source and destination nodes that are located find the probability of occurrence of each node in the path in the selected shortest path 
it may be discrete path algorithm or any kind of uh, shortest path algorithm provide the distance number then send the packets in the path then you can call the eliana in the selected path the, that is my generic path now and save the old probabilities for our if there exist any kind of errors or something if there are no uh, errors then you will be going on estimating the distance cost with the new probabilities and return the new probabilities found update the new probabilities of occurrence from eliana and now exactly we check for error with node that is e of n plus 1 if it is yes then the uh, path of, uh, fi by finding the new probabilities and probability of occurrence uh, of each node within that uh, with respect to that error node with its uh, neighboring node is calculated mm, uh, with using eliana if not uh, that is no if there is no error then we will directly going for sending the packets delivery from source to destination and it will be completed and this is a uh, uh, irritated uh, the iterations may go around 5 to 10 but still uh, it mainly depends on what kind of nodes we have and uh, how the density of nodes yeah. this is how the exact uh, flow thing happens with our uh, LA based ana architecture then uh, with the timing diagram is concerned we can see the intermediate nodes which is uh, iii and ij which are donated in dotted lines and also with the retransmission i2 iii and ij and also with the, both the conditions if it is with i1 or i2 how exactly it comes with so and also we go with uh, knowing the uh, capability of each and node whether it always stays in active state or in sleep no mode as we stick with simulation parameters we are operating at 2.4 gigahertz of range with 100 meters range and uh, the random numbers we had set for 5 terrain and uh, the number of uh, nodes that are varied is uh, 10 to 1000 nodes with uh, random placement as we stick with the uh, propagation limit and uh, radio transmitted power it is minus uh, 111 decibel meter and 20 decibel meter uh, in usual cases uh, everyone will select with 10 decibel meter since we had chosen with larger density nodes we had made that with 20 decibel meter and the standard temperature is 300 kelvin the noise figure and the uh, you know, is selected with 10 and uh, radio uh, receiver type is uh, snr bound type has we uh, the architecture la based ana so as we stick with the performance analysis you can clearly see with throughput uh, it doesn't goes below 50% uh, if i go on increasing the number of nodes at 1000 it had come around 45 but still it's a good thing to have with uh, large density nodes and unicast delivery also and multicast delivery also the the time the milliseconds whatever when we go for transmitting more and more uh, compared to that of lakas the time taken in milliseconds that is uh, packets received within milliseconds is bit uh, around 20% less uh, compared to that of uh, mm, uh, just uh, operating with lakas uh finally the conclusion the process involves adaptability in choosing active nodes in presence of failing neighboring nodes mainly grounded on probability of occurrence it provides a control congestion mechanism thus increase input leading to improve unicast and multicast ratios between source and destination applying for a larger density network in a dynamic environment provides greater adapt adaptability during transmission on the whole if i need to say what would be the outcome of my work is Eliana using the CAD code architecture is designed for ZigBee environment. The performance results are compared through simulation. Uh, the simulation is through NS2. The proposed algorithm is capable of effectively avoiding the congestion. Simulation result shows the increased throughput with decrease in collision at intermediate nodes, and providing unicast and multicast deliveries at low air data rates. And uh, these are uh, few of my references. and uh, thank you गुड मॉर्निंग वन एंड ऑल मैं सब शशिकिरण रिसर्च स्कॉलर विश्वेश्वरा टेक्नोलॉजिकल यूनिवर्सिटी 
presenting a technical seminar on hybrid domain steganography for embedding DES encrypted QR code using random bit binary search under the guidance of Dr. Shaila K, Professor, Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering, Vivekananda Institute of Technology, Bengaluru. Before I start with the presentation, so let me give the overview of the work carried out. So we know that with the development of technology, QR code is used upfront in most of the application since it is easily accessible and data capacity is more. So because of the popularity of the QR code, so maybe in near future, most of the information can be codified and can be accessed just by scanning the QR code. The information in the QR code is not visible to the naked eye and hence a sensitive information can be codified to the QR code. Once the sensitive information is stored or codified as a QR code, it need to be protected by unauthorized person. For the protection, so we have two types of technology, one is cryptography and steganography. So in our research work, we are more concentrated towards steganography, that too in particular image steganography, so which is a most popular digital steganography and which can be achieved in spatial domain, transformation domain and hybrid domain. In the proposed algorithm, we are using discrete wavelet transform and random based binary search technique for embedding the DS encrypted QR code image into a source image. The content of the presentations are like this. Introduction, related work, problem definition, implementation, followed by the performance analysis, conclusions and references. Moving on to the introduction. So what is QR code? A QR code is a quick response code or a matrix barcode. Initially this QR code is used in the automotive industry to have the data for locator and identifier so which is pointing to the website application. The QR code is becoming more popular because of the following reasons. High storage capacity, fast readability and which can be easily scanned by any of the QR code scanning devices. Because of this high storage capacity, application of QR code can be extended to store the individual information in an organization to have it for a quick access. So for example, so by scanning the QR code, I can get the information of a student in an organization. Once the information need to be within the organization or which need to be assessed only by the authorized person, then it is a challenging task with respect to QR code because as of now, the QR code can be easily accessed by anyone. So to protect the QR code information, so we can try with the two approaches. One is encrypting the message which need to be codified into the QR code. The other one is so embedding or hiding the QR code image in the other image so that the another person is not able to see that image. So combining cryptography and steganography so results in a strong security for the information. So moving on to cryptography. So it is a practice and study of secure communication so which falls under two types symmetric key cryptography and asymmetric key cryptography. So when a same key is used for encryption and decryption it is termed as symmetric key cryptography and if the keys are different it is called asymmetric key cryptography. So moving on to steganography it is a technique of hiding or embedding a message or an image or a video in other file. So the different types of steganography are text steganography, audio, video and image steganography. Since our work is more on image, so we will look into the image steganography which is divided into three types, spatial domain steganography, so where the hiding process is directly employed on the pixel without altering the location of the pixels. So transformation domain steganography, so here the images are converted into frequency domain before the hiding process. Then hybrid domain steganography. In this, one of the image will be in a spatial domain and the other image will be in a transformation domain for and then the hiding process will take place. So moving on to literature survey. So why what is QR code? 
so why it is gaining lot of important so what is the advantage of qr code and how the qr code is replaced barcode so all these informations are discussed in the references 1 to 3 the concept of cryptography the types of cryptography advantages and applications are discussed in the references 4 to 8 and similarly the stenography techniques for text technography image audio and video are discussed in the references 9 and 10 so now combining of these things are discussed from the reference 11 the concept of embedding qr code in an image with statistical analysis and probability of detection error is proposed in the reference 11 the high capacity qr code with encryption standards and embedding this QR code into a cover image using a random bit manner is discussed in 12 and 13. The uniform embedding distortion concept used in DCT based stenography for embedding a secret image and the multivariant Gaussian function based stenography is discussed in the reference 14 and 15. So embedding QR code using DWT technique with encryption of data codified to QR code is discussed in reference 16. An algorithm to hide data using stenography and QR code with different cover media such as audio, image and video is discussed in the reference 7. And finally, hybrid stenography algorithm for embedding QR code using DWT technique is discussed in the reference 18. So some of the outcomes of this literature survey are combining cryptography, QR code and stenography to provide a security to information at multiple level is a challenging task. Then the next one is the retrieving the data back from the QR code embedded in other image is not so easy. And since we are using the encryption, so inserting and retrieving the key for encrypted image from the QR code is to be addressed. The problem statement, securing the information codified in QR code by means of crypto technography. So here, so encrypting the data using DS encryption and hiding the QR code in other image by performing stenography using discrete value transform and random bit binary search pixel replacement. The objective of the work is to provide data security using DS encryption to integrate the encrypted message in QR code and to embed the QR code in other image. Some of the assumptions made in the work is the size of the cover image should be a square image. So the two, if it is in the power of two, it's easy for the mathematical analysis. And size of the QR code image should be less than or the half of the size of the cover image. And so whatever the DS encryption information, so that should be within the limit of QR code capacity. The process of implementation is shown in this block diagram. So here we can see the first the image is sorry the first the information is encrypted using the DS encryption and we get the encrypted message. That encrypted message is codified to a QR code image. In the other side a cover image is taken and it is decomposed into its RGB planes or RGB components. So discrete value transform is applied on each of the components to get the LL up, that is approximation coefficients, LH the horizontal coefficients, HL the vertical coefficients and HH the diagonal coefficients of all the three bands. So in these four bands the LL will be having uh, the most of the information related to the image and HH as very less information of the image so we can use the HH band of all the components to embed the QR code image. So this embedding process is will take place using the random bit binary search operation. So once the embedding process is completed again we will go back for the inverse DWT we will transform to get the Stigo image. Now this Stigo image contains or embedded with the QR code which is having an encrypted message. So to 
to get back the message so we need to go for applying a dw2 on stigo image then again we will be getting all the four sub bands so again from the hh band the extraction process will take place in the reverse order of random bit binary search so now the recovered qr code image from the recovered qr code image the encrypted message can be read by using any qr code scanner once the encrypted message is we, we get the encrypted message the decryption uh, algorithm is applied to decode the message so how do we go with the embedding process so the source image can be represented by s of i comma j and the qr code image is represented by q of m comma n so when you apply a dwt so we are going to get the four sub bands so which we are going to represent it as s1 s2 s3 and s4 sub bands so now so we are going to take the matrix or the coefficients of the s4 so then we are converting that into the unsigned numbers so once converting that into an unsigned number that is a uh, previously all the all the bands will be having uh, the decimal values so for a binary search operation so we need so everything should be represented in terms of binary numbers so it is converted into uh, unsigned numbers of one byte so that is in between 0 to 255 how do we insert the qr code image into a cover image so first we'll go with the random bit binary search that is so when we are going to take a pixels so first so we will be looking into a dominating pixel in the msp so that is if the image size is 256 cross 256 or 512 cross 512 so in that we are going to take the first row and we are going to see so which pixels are dominating in that row so if the pixel ones are dominating so then so as a symmetric replacement so in the last uh, uh, row that is the least significant bit so we are going to replace the qr code pixels wherever the first row is one so the qr code pixels are replaced at that position uh, when we are taking the image or the pixel as a symmetry in the same way so we'll go for the next row so here the dominating bits are zero so then wherever there is a zero the corresponding bits has been the corresponding qr code pixels are replaced at that position so in the same way uh, the process will continue till all the qr code pixels has been replaced in the cover image so now the sub band coefficients look something like this after writing process so s1 d2 d3 d4 so here we may see why we are taken LHHL as a D2 and D3. So if the HH band has got filled, then we are going for HL and LH band. Else, so the D2 of uh, uh, M comma N will be equal to LH band itself. So now applying the IWT, so we are going to get the destination image or that is called the Stego image. So again how we are going for the description decryption process it's a, a reverse process operation of the embedding process for de decrypting the information from the stigo image again uh, we will be applying the dwt on the stigo image to get the same sub four bands and so again we we'll look for hl sorry lh hl and hh so and we convert that into unsigned numbers of one byte then we are going to get the uh, sub band coefficients uh, like this so again in this we are going to apply a random bit binary search operation again on the uh, HH, HL and LH band. So usually most of the information will be present in the HH band. So once we get the information from the HH band we will not move forward. So if still so we are expecting the size of the QR code is not met then only we will be moving for HL and LH bands. So now once we get uh, the QR code, so then it is scanned to get the encrypted message. The data obtained uh, from the 
QR code is then decrypted to get the secret information hidden. The performance analysis is carried out using the MSE mean square error and peak signal to noise ratio. So these are the results of the proposed algorithm. So we have worked on around hundreds of images and for uh, uh, references we have taken few of the images here. So these are the images acted as a cover image. So and so these are the results of the QR code with DS encryption and without DS encryption. The first image is a normal QR code where there is a, where the data is not encrypted and the second one is the QR code where the data is encrypted. So below we can see the extracted QR code and the extracted QR code D, uh, with data encryption standards. The performance value obtained for embedding QR code with and without encryption is given like this. So what are the images we have seen here? So just we have taken the PSN val PSNR value for those images. And our algorithm is compared with the other algorithm. So when we are comparing our algorithm with reversible data hiding method, so there, there, are, there is no encryption. So just they are embedding, they embedded some other image in a cover image. So but in our case, we are embedding the QR code image in a cover image. So in the next DWT LSP method, again, there is no encryption. And what are the PSNR value we got is 52.43. In the first two, uh, 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 I mean to say the reversible data hiding method and DWT LSP method, there they embedded some other image, but not the QR code image. But when we take the QR code, it is also an image. So just based on that, we went with the comparison of PSNR value and QR code stenography method. So there is an encryption and they used a normal uh, uh, embedding process, just the normal LSB replacement technique. So and the PSNR got is 50.24 and in the proposed method, we got around 50 on an average of 54.67. So the conclusion is we have information on knowledge, but very less knowledge on information. Information is an asset and providing security to an information is utmost important in the digital era. So proposed algorithm provides security at multiple levels using both cryptography and stenography, resulting in a crypto stego system for security. The existing DS algorithm is used for encrypt encrypting the secret information and stenography is performed in hybrid domain. So these are few of the references uh, I referred during my research work for the particular algorithm. So these are a few more references. Yeah, thank you one and all. Thanks for your patience. The audience, what?
attend to ICTCC Conference 2020. It's my pleasure to be here in order to present our research entitled Design and Testing a Single Passenger Eco Vehicle. This research was was done by our research team including five members I am the first author and it's my honor to be here as presenter today as you know protection of the living and by Roman for sustainable development we are concerned of mankind in particular reducing CO2 emission is the top criteria a number of technology that include a method of improving fossil fuel consumption effectiveness have been introduced and the introduction into automobile in order to limit the negative effects caused by CO2. In this paper, new technological solutions will be proposed. They are combined a novel methods in order to improve vehicle engine performance, to improve emission and air return system and the last one is to reduce friction between vehicle and environment when it is moving the robot methods be applied into a new implemented vehicle for eco milit challenge in short term is EMC 2019, which is organized by Honda Vietnam Company. On test and tournament results of 240 km per liter of RON 98 scheduling in Everest proved that the proposed method is visible and effective in foreign saving. Now I am going to introduce uh, my presentation contents. It includes four parts. The first one is introduction. I am going to introduce briefly about our research work. The second one is solutions and design methods. The third part is testing results and discussion and the last one is some conclusion for our research work as you know for since friends are increasingly shouted that's very important for our life today and the world that vehicle consume depends on many factors we are going to address all the factors in order to save the energy. Therefore, several solutions on vehicle engine technology and vehicle electric system will be proposed. In order to do that, we design and the designs are in order to optimize the vehicle performance and in order to reduce foreign consumption. On the test and tournament reasons of 240 km per liter of RON 98 gasoline in average. I'm going to introduce to you some solutions. The first one we are going to propose a solution on engine. Engine is 
and the engine weight broke by half uh, by cutting off unnecessary parts and components. The second solution is some new technology are applied. We apply a digital electronic temperature sensor, a digital electronic multimeter device, and GPS system. All the new technology are applied into uh, the vehicle in order to monitor uh, the vehicle status. The third solution is that the vehicle electricity system is designed. We apply some new AZ, new parts to be resetted in order to optimize the vehicle performance. After propose some solutions, we are going to design and there are three designs um, has already been done. The first one is the design of chassis. This is the rowing of chassis. Uh, from the top of view, uh, the vehicle uh, is configured by three wheel, two fixed wheel, and one steering wheel. The second one, uh, we are going to design steering mechanism and clutch separation mechanism. The last one, we are going to design and implement the vehicle body. Uh, or you can see, add uh, two button figures. This is the uh, parameter and specification. The first parameter is a uh, transmission ratio. Uh, it has number six. The ratio is six. Uh, the distance between two motor shafts is about 460 millimeter. The driving booster is uh, six down to fry. That means uh, the driver must sits on the vehicle when driving. Steering angle and turning radius is about 8500 mm. Steering mechanism uh, is a kind of trapezoidal scale, rotating shaft and gripper. The winding structure is a disc brake Plus, vibration mechanism either directly from the engine. We are going to uh, we uh, we already we already obtain some reason like this. That is in the um, university on a distance nine point five kilometer, and uh, it take about thirty minutes. For one lap for each route test, the vehicle consume an average of 50 mm, uh, 50 ml per route test, which means that the implemented vehicle could travel an average distance of 189. 24 km with only 1 liter RON95 gasoline. We brought uh, the implemented uh, vehicle to the AMC uh, 2019 and our team performed a lap on a total distance of 9 bond. 5 km with an average speed of at least 25 km per hour and an average time of 
20 minutes and 20 22 minutes and 24 seconds and perform an average of 220 km per liter of RON 98 gasoline and rank in the top 50 over 158 participant team. That's all for our solution, design, and test. Now I'm going to conclude our research work. Uh, a new design methods of a single passenger eco vehicle has been proposed with solutions for innovation of vehicle body, uh, improvement of engine, and enhanced driving arm to save for consumption. Many tests as university prove that ability in foreign consumption is low at 189.24 km per liter of RON95 gasoline. The standard deviation of 5.20 9% prove the stability of design vehicle in traveling part. The more detailed and sci sci scientific designs uh, will be researched and implemented in order to optimize the ability of a co vehicle for consumption in the future. Uh, we are going to research again in order to uh, propose new innovation that's all for our research work and uh, I'm going to end uh, my presentation today uh, now you could um, give me some question and we are going to the part of question and answer. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you again. Dear conference, 
My name is Hải Minh Nguyễn Trân. I am a lecturer of Division of Electronics and Electric Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, Văn Lang University, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Today, I am here to present to the seminar about my report. The name of the report is a study on a methodology of increasing 64 commercial cell regular toilet system. The report contains consists of four parts. Box one, introduction. Box two, the commercial cell regular toilet system and the proposed method. Box three. The evaluation of economic efficiency. Four conclusion. Now I will go into detail what one's introduction. In the recent the case, the transport of oversight and overwide packets with high safety requirement for the cargo and vivo is extremely important to business in the heavy transport industries. The oversight and overwide bucket such as A. Oil rich component needs to be transported from the installation location to the past and then boons to see for collection. B. Transformer from several to Zonton to nearly 300 tons needs to be transported to Bower Station. C. Supervised equipment for oil refineries and thermal power plants. Now I will go to detail but one introduction. The oil mixture of transportation were the use of high power structure to put a boon convoy of cargo shower. This method has many limitations as follow. It is difficult to control the synchronous switch of structures. It is difficult to adjust the center to lower the revised position because its delegation is a different rotation center. It is unable to transport to heavy cargo. The shelf regular trailer come with many special functions are manufactured by employing the modern technology in order to cargo resources of land, over wide and oversight cargo. This shelf regular trailer system greatly improve the limey station of the oil meter. Or system of interest in modern cell regular electric of Cometo, Italia. But two, the Cometo cell regular trailer system and the proposed metro. The first, the Cometo cell regular trailer system. The system consists of main component and fellow bubble back unit. The 443 electronic hydraulic module. The 643 electronic hydraulic module. The BBU link one or more toilet modern together with either vertical or horizontal configuration. The BBU provide the power for 
the 443 electronic hydraulic modem and 643 electronic hydraulic modem. The system operates by uh, this engine that's driving hydraulic boom. Generator and compressor they provide hydraulic electric and steam power for the following main function. Hydraulic drive function, hydraulic boom and hydraulic motor. Steering function, lifting and lowering function, and hydraulic brake function. The second, the, the reverse metal. Using, during operation, the computer system has so many advanced features such as flexible assembly modern are drawn together by vertical or horizontal coupling depending on the size and loss of buckets. Mobile steering system. The ability to say the bucket is 360 degree when not moving and many driving mode. Where steering, parallel steering, single head steering. The ability to sit the center of steering system in order to adjust to trailer to overcome difficult draw without interfering with the infinite programming. However, the commercial cell regular trailer system still retain main problem during operation. It's cleaning the frequent failure of electronic loss sensing ELS well. Therefore, a new method was proposed in order to handle fastly the ELS van damage. A throttle. Well, M E interest between the C and E L as well. Accordingly, when the E L as well fell, no matter the state of the C and without blocking the C, the hydraulic bump is adjusted by turning the rust vast M only so that the system pressure. With a display on the driving pressure gal reached to 200 bar or 220 bar, the system works steadily by two pressure when more pressure in is needed. The road foil um, continues to be adjusted. This session now with the installation of a new growth van M that's EU to relay the hydraulic control valve ELS if it's in unnecessarily damaged or file as illustrated. Since installing the throw valve am into the hydraulic system controlling the boom. The cell problem trailer system work very stable and safe. The self problem trailer system safely and efficiently transport a lot of petroleum buckets. 
on the recess after November 2012 with application of the proposed method of improving the hydraulic system for commuter shell regular trailer have met many investors just our company and we the reputation of the gentleman is the leading company in Swedish Asia and 34 rent the in the world is the oversight and overwide transportation. But for conclusion, with the new installation of a bug in the high rally system, it has brought a great effect to the business. Risking be a mind of far investor, increasing mobility for transport equipment and grease, reducing troubleshooting time when children are under loss as well. However, I would like to introduce in this article a kind of world specific trailer that has been approved for a long time in the world but it's a still very new in Vietnam. Hopefully, but letting that company in Vietnam will skip the system in the future and bust them into new more, improve efficiency, increasingly develops oversight of a wide market transportation industry in order to reach to the world status. Besides commercial, there are many companies producing modern shell property electric shell property trailer system system Gopher, Nicholas, Kamar each company had distribution was on the them even Advanced operational visual for purpose of absolute such for goods and people. However, it's necessary to note that the third well am only replace the EL as well in an emergency well. When the the incident of course because the MOL only work with money adjustment, this MOL cannot rely the ELS well completely because the ELS well open and close automatically via electronic control in the BBU. When the loss starts, the EL as well automatically adjusts accordingly. Therefore, the EL as well replacement should be performed when the system in is maintained up after the process. Thank you for your listening.
the participant the sixth international congress on nature of competition and communication ICTCC 2020 ended successfully and smoothly after one day of intensive and inspired work on the behalf of uh, the organizing committee we would like to express our sincere gratitude for your contribution special thanks go to the presenter keynote speaker chairs and honor discussion who have contributed a great deal to the success of the conference we hope that all the participants have found some valuable insight and begun building an active network of those deeply interested in the field of the nature of computing once again thank you for your outstanding contribution we look forward to working with you on the future events Maybe sis.